Lily's solitary summer. Lily sat cross-legged on the grass, gazing at the mirror-like pond in front of her. The clouds overhead were reflected perfectly in the still water. Only a week into her summer vacation, she already found herself wishing she were back at Hogwarts. Home wasn't living up to the lively picture she had imagined during the train ride back to London. She had dreamed of long, sunny afternoons spent with Severus Snape, exchanging stories about their professors and speculating on the new challenges awaiting them in their second year. She had also imagined a peaceful reconciliation with her sister, Petunia, hoping they'd bond over magic and play around with spells like the ones from Teen Witch magazine. But reality had shattered those hopes almost immediately. The moment she stepped off the train, she was reminded that underage witches and wizards weren't allowed to use magic outside of school until they were of age. The Teen Witch subscription now seemed more disappointing than exciting. And as for Petunia, any hopes of mending their relationship had been dashed when she refused to come to King's Cross to pick Lily up. Petunia's jealousy had only grown more intense to the point where she demanded her own room. Lily returned to find her sister had moved out, leaving her alone in a room that once felt shared and full of life, but now felt cold and empty. The loneliness didn't stop there. Severus, her closest friend, had promised they would see each other during the summer, but he hadn't been around at all. On the first day of break, Lily had cycled to their usual meeting spot, expecting to find him waiting. But Severus hadn't shown up. Days passed, and still, there was no sign of him. When she pedaled to Spinner's End in the hope of finding him at home, the house was silent and dark. Without Severus, and with no other friends in her neighborhood, Lily felt more isolated than ever. She tried to pass the time, over the course of a week, she had written several letters to her school friend, Alice Bell, read Hogwarts a history from cover to cover, and even made friendship bracelets for her friends, including one for Remus Lupin, though she felt too embarrassed to think about giving it to him. The idea of making bracelets for all the Gryffindor boys had crossed her mind, but after a while, even crafting lost its appeal. As she lay back on the grass, her fiery red hair spread out in all directions, she closed her eyes and tried to block out the ache of missing Hogwarts. The clouds above reminded her of the adventures she'd shared with her friends at school, making her long for the excitement and belonging she felt there. Lily, she jolted upright. She must have dozed off, although she didn't remember falling asleep. The sun was much lower now, casting long shadows, and the pond had turned a dull gray as evening approached. Over the hill, she saw Severus coming toward her. His hair was longer, greasier, and he was wearing the same two small jeans that ended awkwardly at his ankles. His wand was tucked through his belt loop. Hey, Severus said, sitting down beside her. I was hoping you'd be here. I've been here every day this week, Lily replied, her voice tinged with disappointment. Sorry, he muttered. I wasn't around. I know. I went by your house, Lily said, glancing at him. Severus wrinkled his nose. Spinner's end? Why'd you go there? I was looking for you, she answered, her tone matter-of-fact. He laughed softly. Oh, I haven't been staying there much. My dad's left. Mum and I have been with some family. He almost mentioned the Malfoys, but stopped, knowing it was a sensitive subject between them. How's your summer been? He asked, changing the subject. Boring, Lily sighed. I don't have any friends around here, except for you, and you've been off wherever. She paused before adding, I didn't say it was your fault. Severus plucked a leaf from the ground and twirled it between his fingers. With a soft breath, uh, he transformed it into a small butterfly, which fluttered over and landed on Lily's knee. She stared at it, a faint smile tugging at her lips. You shouldn't be doing magic outside of school, she chided him gently. She reached out to touch the butterfly, and in a puff, it turned back into a leaf. It reminded her of fairy tales, like Cinderella, when the magic wore off and everything turned back to normal. Severus shrugged. I can do magic whenever I want. The ministry doesn't scare me. They could still catch you, Lily warned, raising an eyebrow. You're always such a rule follower, Lily, he teased, as if that were something to be ashamed of. Lily held back her urge to reprimand him again. She didn't want to spoil their time together. Taking a deep breath, she changed the subject. How's your mum doing? And where did your dad go? Who knows? Severus said with a dismissive wave. 
I don't care. He's gone, and that's what matters. Mum's better off without him. She's getting along with her family now that he's out of the picture. I've been doing well at school, so things are all right. Lily looked down at her hands. So you're not staying long? Severus shook his head. No, we're just back to get some of my mum's things. For a moment, an awkward silence settled between them. Severus glanced at her, sensing something unsaid. He couldn't help himself. He let his mind slip into hers, searching for the source of her unease. Lily immediately felt his intrusion. She pushed his shoulder sharply. Stop that, she snapped. I didn't invite you into my head. You miss your friends, Severus said quietly. Of course I do, Lily retorted. You didn't need to pry into my mind to figure that out. He bit his lip. You think of them as your friends now, huh? Lily shrugged, looking away. Severus started braiding a few strands of grass, his fingers working absentmindedly. Freaks, you're mad at me. No, I'm not, she said, exhaling. I just miss you. I barely see you at school because you're always worried about what your Slytherin friends will think. Now it's summer, and you're still not around. It's not fair. Severus sat quietly, staring at the grass in his hands, unsure how to respond. Lily's words hung in the air, filled with a sadness neither of them knew how to fix. Severus let out a frustrated sigh. I can't help it, Lily. I've got a lot on my plate now. I can't just sit by the pond with you every day like I used to. He stood, brushing the dirt off his hands. I'm responsible for things now. I've got my mum to look after and other friends. His tone was dismissive, almost defensive. Lily shot back, her temper flaring. Oh, that's convenient. You can have other friends, but when I do, it's suddenly a problem. She stood up as well, now a little taller than him, her recent growth spurt making the difference more pronounced. Severus's voice rose, his frustration bubbling over. It's not that you have friends, Lily. It's who they are. Sirius Black and James Potter? They're arrogant, and you know how they treat people. Why would you want to be around them? They don't treat everyone like that, Lily replied, though her voice wavered. They treat me like that. Severus snapped, his voice thick with hurt, and I thought I was your best mate. You are my best mate, Sev, she said softly. You'll always be. But Severus shook his head, his face clouded with bitterness. Well, you're not acting like it lately, he muttered. Lily sighed. Neither are you, she replied quietly. The words hung in the air between them. For a moment, they stood there, locked in a tense silence. Lily felt a wave of guilt wash over her for how she'd yelled at him. She took a deep breath and softened her tone. Look, I'm sorry I haven't been a great friend lately, and I'm sorry for what your friends call me. Mudblood, right? Severus's face flushed with shame, hearing the word come come from her hurt in a way he couldn't fully explain. It was a painful reminder of the divide that had slowly grown between them. The same friends he was trying to impress were the ones insulting her. He hated that realization, but he couldn't bring himself to deny it. After all, by their standards, she was exactly what they said. Lily studied his face, hoping for something, an apology, an explanation. But when none came, her heart sank. I'm going home, she said quietly, breaking the silence. It's getting late anyway. She hesitated before asking, Will I see you soon? I don't know, Severus muttered, still unable to meet her eyes. I'll try to come by this weekend. Lily nodded, biting her lip. I'm glad your mum's doing better, Sev. I really hope things work out for you. Her voice cracked on the last few words, and before he could say anything, she turned and hurried away across the grass, fighting back tears. Severus watched her go, feeling helpless, rooted to the spot by the pond. He stared at the water as the moon reflected on its surface, wondering when their friendship had become so complicated, when everything had gotten so tangled. When Lily got home, she told her parents she wasn't hungry and retreated to her bedroom. Despite feeling lonely all week, all she wanted now was to be alone. She shut her door, leaning against it for a moment to compose herself, but when she turned, she gasped. An owl sat perched on her windowsill. Her heart leapt with hope. Maybe it was a letter from Alice or one of the girls from school. She rushed over, opening the window. The owl stuck out its leg impatiently, and Lily quickly untied the letter. Without waiting for a thank you, the owl flew off into the night. Lily held the envelope, surprised by the unfamiliar handwriting. It was clearly addressed to her, though. As she turned it over, she noticed a black wax seal with an intricate crest she didn't recognize. 
curious, she broke the seal and unfolded the letter inside. The handwriting was messy but legible. Evans. Bet you didn't expect a letter from me, huh? Honestly, I didn't think I'd be writing you either. I hope this reaches you. I'm not sure of your address, but my owl, Adolf, usually figures it out. I've been stuck at home, bored out of my mind. I'm avoiding my parents, they barely talk to me anyway, and my brother Regulus has been cozying up to our creepy house elf creature. It's like he's becoming their perfect little son, doing everything I won't. I reckon he'll end up in Slytherin next year. Wouldn't that be just perfect? The only thing keeping me sane is thinking about Quidditch tryouts next term, though with a school broom, I doubt I'll make the team. Anyway, enough about me. How's your summer been? Write back if you're bored. My address is number 12, Grimald Place. Best, Sirius Black. Lily blinked at the signature, surprised. Of all people, she hadn't expected to hear from Sirius Black. He must be truly bored, she murmured to herself. Still, she was curious and a little bored herself, so she sat down at her desk, switched on the lamp, and pulled out a piece of stationery to respond. Weeks passed, and Sirius lay on his bed, grinning at the enchanted mirror in his hand. You'll never guess who's been writing to me, he said smugly to James, whose sleepy face filled the mirror. James perked up immediately, eyes widening in disbelief. Wait! Lily Evans? You're kidding! Sirius smirked, enjoying his friend's reaction. Nope. She wrote back after I sent her a letter. James scowled, his jealousy barely hidden. What did you write to her for? Sirius shrugged. I wrote to a bunch of people. It's been a boring summer. Not like I was going to write to Snivellus, though. James tried to sound casual, but failed. So what'd she say? Sirius chuckled. She said her summer's been rubbish. Seems Snivellus has been avoiding her. James frowned. How do you avoid Lily Evans? That's impossible. Guess he's been busy with his new friends, Sirius replied, rolling his eyes. Probably practicing dark magic with Malfoy and the rest. Figures, James muttered. Did she say anything else? She offered to lend me her broom for Quidditch tryouts, Sirius said with a grin, leaving James to fume in silence. James raised an eyebrow. That's rather generous of her. Sirius nodded, his eyes bright with excitement. Sure is. If I don't have to rely on those beat-up old-school brooms, I might actually have a shot at making the team this year. That's great, James replied. Lily isn't trying out, is she? I have no clue, Sirius said, tilting his head in thought. I didn't think she was into Quidditch, James shrugged. Most muggle-born students don't have experience before coming to Hogwarts, but I know she has a broom. Sirius looked uncertain. Maybe I could convince Mother to spare a few galleons so I can get my own broom. He didn't believe it, though. His mother barely gave him her attention, let alone money. That's a long shot, James said, mirroring Sirius's doubt. The conversation shifted as it often did to Sirius's family. While Berga had thrown a fit when she discovered Sirius had redecorated his room in Gryffindor colors, he had replaced the green duvet with maroon and plastered Gryffindor banners everywhere. She'd called him a blood traitor, a disgrace to the family. In defiance, Sirius had asked James to send him loads of muggle things, magazines about motorbikes and music. The barrage of muggle culture had infuriated his mother to the point where she banned him from using the family owl. But Sirius found a workaround, sending letters through Bubo, James's owl, much to Walburga's further displeasure. Sirius, in his rebellion, had become fascinated by muggle punk rock, fashion, and motorbikes. Lily even sent him a record by a muggle musician, John Lennon. In her note, she wrote, He might as well be magic. Sirius had taken to playing the song Imagine, loudly, further aggravating his mother. He had plastered the walls of his room with ripped-out pages of muggle magazines, transforming his personal space into a chaotic collage of rebellion. Despite his defiance, Sirius hadn't been able to gather any useful information about the Dark Lord from his family. Conversations stopped the moment he entered the room. His parents and even Regulus gave him nothing but cold stares. The only one who would speak to him was Creature, though the house elf's muttering mostly echoed his mother's hateful words. Sirius felt trapped, utterly miserable. He often fantasized about escaping, but fear held him back. Dumbledore had offered help, and James had invited him over more than once, even sending a muggle underground pass to make it easier. But Sirius never went. What if he wore out his welcome at the Potters? What then? Where would he go next summer? He imagined himself homeless, 
wandering the streets like the muggle vagrants he'd seen in London with nothing but a few belongings and a shopping cart. James interrupted his thoughts. You know, I'd love to see Evans play Quidditch. Sirius grinned. You'd love to see Evans do anything. Shut up, James snapped, though a slight flush crept into his cheeks. I don't fancy her. She's just a friend. A very pretty friend, Sirius teased. James shrugged nonchalantly, but Sirius knew better. I just like to see her on a broom, James continued, brushing off the teasing. Think Derek will still be captain? Sirius asked, shifting the topic. Yeah, he already told me he's staying on, James confirmed. By the way, have you got your exam results yet? Not yet, Sirius said. I'm sure I did awful in astronomy, but charms and defense should be okay. Uh, transfiguration? Not so much. And history of magic? Don't even get me started. He pulled a face. James chuckled. Binns really takes the fun out of it, doesn't he? Goblin wars should be thrilling. I know, right? But instead, Sirius imitated snoring, making James laugh even harder. The two friends continued talking late into the night before deciding it was time for bed. James had an early start the next morning. He was going fishing with his father and the muggle neighbor, a tradition that baffled Sirius. Why do muggles think fish are easier to catch before sunrise? James had wondered aloud earlier. As Sirius stowed his enchanted mirror under the bed, he heard an odd noise outside his door. Opening it, he found Creature crouched on the landing, his ear pressed against the crack under the door. What do you think you're doing? Sirius demanded, startling the elf, who scrambled to his feet, his large eyes wide with fear. The blood trader thinks Creature will tell him his master's secrets, the elf muttered, backing away cautiously. Who told you to spy on me? Sirius asked, his anger rising. Tell me, Creature. The elf looked conflicted, wringing his hands. Creature was commanded not to say, he mumbled, not allowed to tell who wants to know what the blood trader is up to. Who commanded you? Sirius pressed, his voice sharp. After a moment of hesitation, Creature finally whispered, Master Regulus. Sirius stormed across the hall and pounded on Regulus's door. Regulus, open up. Go away. I'm asleep. Came the muffled reply. Sirius, fed up, pulled out his wand. He knew he wasn't supposed to do magic outside of school, but he had heard that the Ministry could only detect magic in muggle-born households. His family, with its long line of wizards, wouldn't be monitored the same way. If ever there was a time to take that risk, this was it. Breaking bonds! Alohomora! Sirius bellowed, and the door clicked open. He barged into the room, his face twisted in frustration. Regulus sat up in bed, eyes wide with disbelief. What do you think you're doing? This is my room, he hissed. Get out! No, Sirius responded flatly, stepping further inside. Behind him, Creature scurried in, looking panicked. The house elf's large eyes darted nervously between the two brothers, clutching the edge of Regulus's bed with trembling hands. Wawa, the blood trader forced Creature to tell him, Master. Creature whimpered, burying his face in the blanket. Please don't hurt Creature, Master Regulus. Please. Regulus sighed with obvious irritation. Creature, stop it. I'm not going to hurt you. Creature is so sorry, Master. So sorry. Creature sobbed, his voice filled with remorse. Enough, Creature, Regulus commanded, a hint of weariness in his tone. I order you to stop crying. Instantly, the house elf silenced himself, though he still looked miserable. Regulus shifted his attention back to his brother. Now leave, he demanded coldly. Sirius crossed his arms, refusing to budge. Not until you tell me why Creature's been spying on me. I heard you last night, Regulus answered, his voice bitter. Who were you talking to? That's none of your business, Sirius retorted, eyes narrowing. Or are you just trying to report back to Mother? Isn't it enough that you're her perfect little lapdog? You have to meddle in my life, too? Regulus's expression hardened. Mother said you're not supposed to mix with your disgraceful friends from school. Maybe you'd be in less trouble if you actually listened to her for once. Sirius let out a derisive laugh. Yes, let's all listen to Mother and her twisted views about blood purity. Let's all follow along like sheep and bow down to you-know-who. Lord Voldemort is a great leader, Regulus shot back, his face flushing. He's what the wizarding world needs, someone who will bring back order and strength. Sirius shook his head, an incredulous smile playing on his lips. You don't know anything. You've barely left this house. You've never even seen the world beyond these walls. I know enough, Regulus insisted, his voice rising. 
You've been brainwashed by Dumbledore. He's nothing but an old fool. Sirius paused, his voice growing more serious. I've met Dumbledore. Yes, he's eccentric, but he's not the madman you think he is. Memories of Dumbledore flashed in his mind. The commanding presence, the protective force that surrounded him, and the warmth in his eyes that made even the darkest times feel bearable. Dumbledore wasn't perfect, but he was the closest thing Sirius had seen to real hope. Regulus scoffed, dismissing Sirius's words with a wave of his hand. You've always been naive. And your precious Voldemort? Sirius countered. He's terrified of Dumbledore. You know that, don't you? He can talk big all he wants, but deep down, he knows Dumbledore is the one thing standing in his way. Regulus's face flushed with anger, his hands clenched into fists. Get out, he barked, pointing at the door. You're not welcome in here ever again. Sirius didn't flinch. His expression darkened as he shot back. You think I want to be here? Keep your filthy little house elf out of my way, or I'll make sure he's tied up in the laundry for good. With that, he stormed out, slamming the door so hard it echoed down the hall. Back in his own room, Sirius slammed his door shut just as loudly, collapsing against it. He rubbed his eyes, feeling the weight of frustration settle heavily on his shoulders. For a brief moment, all was quiet. Then came the faint, familiar scraping sound from outside. Creature, no doubt, eavesdropping through the crack beneath the door. Without thinking, Sirius banged his fist against the wood, hard. A small squeak of pain came from the other side, but Sirius didn't care. The sound reverberated in the stillness of the house, a reminder of how isolated he truly was. The long dining hall of Malfoy Manor was filled with a heavy, oppressive air as Voldemort lifted his goblet to his lips. Seated near the far end of the table, Severus Snape couldn't tear his eyes away from the black stone ring gleaming on the Dark Lord's hand. It caught the candlelight every time he moved, drawing Severus's attention again and again. His mother, Eileen, sat beside him, her gaze locked on Voldemort with an intensity matched only by Bellatrix Lestrange, who stared at him from across the table. Eileen, like so many others in the room, owed the Dark Lord everything. Severus ate slowly, his appetite dimmed by the richness of the meal. The Malfoys prided themselves on their lavish dinners, but to Severus, the food felt like lead in his stomach. Even after a month of living here, he had yet to grow accustomed to the indulgent fare. He nudged a piece of greasy duck around his plate, wishing for something simpler, something that didn't make him feel so out of place. Voldemort's ring flashed again, drawing Severus's eyes upward just as the Dark Lord smiled, a cruel, calculating smile that sent a chill down Severus's spine. My friends, Voldemort purred, his voice soft yet commanding, I am delighted to share such a splendid evening with you all. His long, pale fingers caressed the enormous snake coiled around his shoulders, its tongue flickering in the air like a serpent tasting fear. Thank you, Abraxas, for hosting this fine gathering. Abraxas Malfoy, seated close to the head of the table, beamed with pride. It is an honor, my lord. Anytime. Voldemort rose from his chair, his serpent still draped across him, hissing softly as if in agreement. The chair scraped against the floor with an eerie sound that seemed to echo in the silence. He began to walk around the table, his hands ghosting over the shoulders of those seated, as if marking each one of them, claiming them as his own. Severus watched, his heart pounding in his chest. Every gesture, every word from Voldemort was a reminder of the dark path he had chosen, a path from which there was no turning back. The faces around the table reflected a shared devotion, but within Severus's mind, doubt quietly simmered beneath the surface. Voldemort continued his slow circuit around the table, his voice soft but filled with a terrifying certainty. Together, we will reshape the world. As he passed behind Severus, the weight of his presence pressed down, suffocating as if the very air had turned dark and thick. Severus lowered his eyes to his plate, pushing the food around again, knowing that in this room, loyalty was not a choice. It was a command. The Ministry of Magic has launched yet another one of their feudal campaigns. Voldemort began, his voice a low hiss that commanded the attention of everyone at the table. As you may have noticed from the owls this morning, with a casual flick of his wrist, he produced a pamphlet from his robes and tossed it down the length of the table. It slid along the rich, dark fabric and came to rest just in front of Severus, who eyed it with disdain. 
Around the table, a few snickers rose from the Death Eaters, but Voldemort's expression remained deadly serious. This pathetic piece of propaganda, Voldemort sneered, is endorsed by none other than Albus Dumbledore, the so-called protector of our children's minds. His voice dripped with venom as he rounded the table, his fingers brushing briefly over Severus's shoulder as if to emphasize the irony Severus had once been among those children shaped by Dumbledore's influence. Severus glanced at the pamphlet. It was garish, colored in gold and purple with the words Muggle Liaison Coalition emblazoned at the top. Beneath the headline was a grotesque caricature of a wizard embracing a muggle family, the image filled with saccharine joy. Voldemort's voice grew sharper. This disgraceful document claims that muggles deserve equal treatment to wizards, that we are duty-bound to protect them. Worse, it asserts that mudbloods are to be afforded the same rights as the rest of us. His lips curled in disgust. Orion Black, already deep in his cups, chuckled boisterously. Complete rubbish! he slurred, his mustache twitching as he laughed. His wife, Walburga, shot him a sharp look, placing her hand on his arm to silence him. Voldemort moved behind Bellatrix, resting his hands on her shoulders as if bestowing favor upon his most loyal follower. She practically melted at his touch, her face alight with fanatical devotion. Her husband, Rudolphus, glanced sideways, his expression betraying the briefest flicker of envy before returning to its stoic mask. The traitors who spread these lies must be stopped, Voldemort continued, his voice now a silken whisper. The ministry seeks to strip us of our birthright, to diminish what makes us powerful, what makes us superior. He paused, allowing his words to hang in the air, a promise of retribution. Bellatrix, overcome with passion, shrieked, You are our strength, my lord. None can compare to you. Voldemort offered her a thin smile, though it barely reached his eyes. He continued his slow circuit around the table, finally resuming his seat at the head. With a languid gesture, he stroked the chin of Nagini, his massive serpent coiled by the fire, her forked tongue flicking out lazily. We will make it clear that we will not tolerate their degradation of us, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. His eyes flicked toward the pamphlet. Bella, Rudolphus, dispose of that filth. He gestured toward the pamphlet without even glancing at it. Severus, sitting closest to the pamphlet, wondered briefly why Voldemort hadn't asked him to take care of it. His fingers twitched slightly as he resisted the urge to reach for it, but no one else seemed to find it odd. Bellatrix and Rudolphus didn't even move. Voldemort's attention returned to Nagini, his fingers stroking her scales with a tenderness that made Severus uneasy. The serpent let out a soft hiss, as if responding to his murmured reassurances. We will remind them who they are dealing with, Voldemort said softly, his voice sending a chill around the table. Later that night, after most of the Death Eaters had left the Malfoy estate, Severus found himself walking down a dimly lit hallway. The flickering green torches cast long, eerie shadows across the centuries-old portraits of Malfoy ancestors, each face pale and proud, a testament to their unbroken pure-blood lineage. The silence in the corridor was suffocating, only broken by the occasional crackle of the flames. Severus had been assisting the Dark Lord with legilimency for weeks now, helping him sharpen his already formidable skills. Each night, Severus was reminded of the delicate balance he had to maintain, the constant effort to keep his own thoughts buried deep beneath layers of acclumency. He had trained himself well, hiding the few precious memories of Lily Evans where even Voldemort could not reach. It was the only place she was truly safe, kept far from the Dark Lord's prying mind. He reached the heavy wooden door that led to Voldemort's chambers and raised his hand to knock. But before he could, the cold voice called from within. Come in, Severus. I know you're there. Severus pushed the door open and stepped inside. Voldemort sat by the fireplace, Nagini coiled by his feet, her eyes glowing in the dim light. The Dark Lord was examining his wand with unusual care, his gaunt features illuminated by the flickering flames. He looked up, meeting Severus's eyes with an unreadable expression. You've been helping me grow stronger in legilimency, Voldemort said softly, and for that, I am grateful. His eyes glinted with something dangerous, though Severus couldn't be sure if it was suspicion or approval. But we must always remember, Severus, knowing how to read minds is only part of the battle. To truly defeat an enemy, one must know more than their thoughts. 
Severus frowned slightly, unsure of where the conversation was heading. Voldemort's gaze drifted back to the fire. You must know your enemy's heart, he continued. Understand what they value, what they fear. Only then can you truly crush them. He stroked Nagini's head as she shifted lazily. Like my Nagini, she knows exactly where to strike when she kills. Precision, Severus. Precision wins battles. Severus felt a chill crawl up his spine as he glanced at the serpent. How did Voldemort know Nagini could kill so effectively? The thought was unnerving. And what of your enemies at Hogwarts? Voldemort asked, his tone conversational but laced with an edge. The Lupin boy, for instance, is he not one of them? Severus stiffened slightly, not expecting the sudden turn of conversation. He knew Voldemort was testing him, probing for weaknesses or hesitations. But Severus had learned long ago to guard his thoughts, and more importantly, his heart. Severus glanced up, surprised. I suppose so, but why bring him up? Voldemort's gaze was cold and sharp. Lyle Lupin, head of the Interspecies Liaison Office, father of Remus Lupin, your rival. I thought you'd know more about your adversaries. Always be aware of who stands against you. He studied Severus with a penetrating look. Ignorance of your enemies is a weakness, one you should not indulge. Still perplexed, Severus nodded, unsure where the Dark Lord was leading the conversation. Voldemort, now engrossed with his wand, smiled darkly. You were confused at dinner, about the disposal. Let me clarify. He gestured with his wand, as though orchestrating some unseen spectacle. The actions of tonight will prove beneficial to you, especially when you return to Hogwarts. Know your enemies, Severus. Understand where they are vulnerable. Severus shifted uneasily. What are you planning, my lord? A gleam of twisted delight crossed Voldemort's face, the facade of charm fading into a sinister grin. Lyle Lupin will soon learn that spreading lies comes with consequences. By dawn, his influence will be... diminished. Bellatrix Lestrange moved through the trees with a wild grin, singing an eerie melody, her voice disrupting the silence of the woods. Killing half-bloods, killing half-bloods on orders of the Dark Lord. Rodolphus followed behind, grumbling, Keep it down, Bella. You'll have half the forest awake. But his own heavy footsteps broke branches underfoot, adding to the disturbance. Bellatrix spun around him in a mad dance, her hair whipping in the breeze, excitement burning in her eyes. The Dark Lord chose us for this mission, darling. It's an honor. She twirled around a fallen branch, her exhilaration almost palpable. He trusts us. Rodolphus watched her with a mix of irritation and weariness. The marriage was more a convenience than love, a pure-blood union that had been expected. But Bella's obsession with Voldemort had long overshadowed any affection she might have shown him. She lived for the Dark Lord's approval, and he was nothing more than a companion in her delusion. As they neared the house, Rodolphus raised a hand to quiet her. We're close. Bella's gleeful expression turned predatory as they crouched, peering at the small, dimly lit home. Rodolphus pointed to a window. That one. We go in there. The thrill in Bellatrix's eyes was unmistakable, her entire being alive with the prospect of violence. They moved swiftly, crossing the yard in the pale moonlight. Inside, Lyle Lupin had dozed off in his armchair, the long day of work having taken its toll. The low hum of his snores filled the living room, his feet propped up on an ottoman. Hope, his wife, smiled at him from across the room as she gathered the teacups and gently placed a blanket over him. In the kitchen, she hummed quietly to herself, unaware of the danger creeping closer. Upstairs, Rodolphus cursed under his breath as he stumbled over a pile of books, crashing into a desk. Bloody hell, he muttered. Episky, Bellatrix whispered, healing the minor cut with a quick flick of her wand. They crept to the bed, grins of anticipation on their faces. Rodolphus grabbed the blanket and yanked it down. Both cast the killing curse simultaneously, but instead of a body, they struck a pillow, feathers exploding into the air. Bella shrieked in frustration, tripping over the same books that had caught Rodolphus. Her unhinged laughter quickly turned into a fit of fury. Hope Lupin, hearing the commotion upstairs, wiped her hands on her apron and headed toward the bedroom. Assuming it was just an owl from one of Remus's friends, she muttered to herself as she ascended the stairs, That boy never listens. I told him to close the window. She opened the door just as Bellatrix screamed, Avada Kedavra! The curse hit Hope directly and she collapsed without a sound.
Lyle Lupin awoke to the sound of a scream, his heart racing. Disoriented, he rubbed his eyes, trying to make sense of the dream he'd been having. Something about a vacation, flowers in Hope's hair. But the scream pulled him into reality. He stood, calling out, Hope? Love? There was no answer. Worried, he checked the kitchen. The dishes had been half done, the teacups still sitting on the counter. Where was she? Panic set in as he glanced out the window and saw two figures sprinting across the yard. Stop! Lyle shouted, rushing out the door. Who are you? What are you doing? He chased after them, but they were fast, leaping the fence at the end of the garden and disappearing into the woods. The echo of laughter, light and sinister, lingered in the air. The dark mark's shadow! Lyle Lupin froze as the figure near the forest edge stopped and raised its hand. A deep, gravelly voice echoed through the night air. Morse Mordra! The man's face was hidden by the shadows of the trees, but Lyle could see the slight wave of his fingers before the figure disappeared into the woods. Suddenly, the sky above his house was illuminated by an unnatural green light. His heart pounded as he looked up. There it was, hanging ominously above his home. A skull with a snake slithering through its mouth, twisted and sinister. Lyle's stomach dropped. He had seen this symbol before. Voldemort, he whispered, dread filling his voice. Panic surged through his body like poison, curling through him just as the snake coiled through the skull above. Without hesitation, he sprinted back toward the house, the weight of his fear driving him forward. No, 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 please. He muttered desperately as he pushed the door open. The quiet inside now felt unbearable, suffocating. Hope, his voice cracked with urgency as he called for his wife, but the silence that followed was more terrifying than any answer. Hope. Lyle dashed up the stairs, clinging to the desperate hope that she was safe, maybe asleep and unaware of the horrors outside. But as he reached the landing, his heart sank deeper than he thought possible. Her arm, still and lifeless, lay just outside the door to Remus's room. A pearl bracelet, once vibrant, now gleamed with an eerie reflection from the green light spilling in through the window. The faint glint of her wedding band sent a wave of grief crashing over him. Hope, he gasped, choking on his words as he collapsed beside her, his body trembling with anguish. At the Potter's Breakfast Table James Potter was casually eating his breakfast when his father, Charles, walked into the room, pale and grim, his eyes glued to the front page of the newspaper. Bloody hell, Charlotte muttered, clearly disturbed. What's the matter? Dora asked from the stove, her wand flicking over the frying pan as she cooked Charlotte's bacon. A ministry official's wife has been murdered, Charlotte said slowly, disbelief on his face, in their own home. He scanned the article again, frowning deeply. Moody thinks it's connected to the Muggle Liaison Coalition pamphlet we received last week. Dora's expression tightened in concern. No she whispered, horrified by the implications. James, still chewing his toast, looked up. Moody? He taught us defense against the dark arts for a bit last year, he said, remembering the grizzled Auror's lessons. Charles barely acknowledged the comment, distracted. A terrible tragedy, he muttered. And they have a son, about your age, James. Do you know him? He slid the paper across the table. James stared at the page, his fork clattering to the table as the name hit him. Remus! he exclaimed, his voice tight with shock. Dora turned around, her brow furrowed. You know him? That's Remus Lupin. He's my mate, James said, his stomach twisting. His mum. His voice trailed off, the horror of the situation sinking in. Blimey, he muttered, feeling sick to his core. Charles looked at him, sympathy etched on his face, but there was nothing more to say. James pushed his plate away, suddenly repulsed by the smell of breakfast. The picture in the article showed a younger Remus smiling up at his mum during what seemed to be a family holiday in Paris. It was hard to reconcile that happy image with the tragedy James had just learned about. I'm going upstairs, James muttered, standing abruptly. I need to write him. Charlus nodded, taking the paper back as James left the room. The weight of words. James sat at his desk, a blank piece of parchment before him. He stared at it for what felt like hours unable to put his thoughts into words. Everything he wanted to say felt wrong, inadequate. How could he possibly express his sorrow? Grief like this couldn't be neatly wrapped in words. James. Sirius's voice broke the silence, coming from the enchanted mirror on James's bedside table. With a sigh, James stood up and retrieved the mirror. 
He turned it over to see Sirius's face, his hair more disheveled than usual. Hello, James said quietly as he sat back down, still feeling the weight of the news. I'm losing it, Sirius muttered, his voice thick with frustration. That blasted house elf won't stop following me, spying on me for Regulus, no doubt. His scowl deepened as he glanced away, likely at his door. I hate this house. James, feeling there was no point in dragging out the inevitable, decided to cut to the chase. Voldemort killed Remus's mum. Sirius went silent, his expression frozen in disbelief. What? He whispered, his voice barely audible. James shifted in his chair, uncomfortable. It's all over the papers. Moody's saying it happened because Remus's dad is pushing for muggle rights at the ministry. They think that's why the Death Eaters targeted her. Sirius's face darkened and James could see his friend swallowing back his emotions. The hatred simmering in Sirius's eyes was all too familiar, a fiery resentment for the world he'd been born into and especially for the Dark Lord who embodied everything Sirius despised. I've been trying to write to him, James continued, but I don't know what to say. I've never had a friend lose someone like this before. Sirius's anger flared suddenly, his fists clenched. I hate Voldemort, he spat through gritted teeth. He ruins everything, everyone. He destroys. His voice cracked as angry tears welled in his eyes, the same intense rage James had seen before when Sirius talked about escaping his family's dark legacy. James nodded, sharing the sentiment. I hate him too, mate. We all do. In mid-July, Lily received her book list for the second year at Hogwarts. She and her parents headed to Diagon Alley to collect everything they needed. Petunia, her older sister, refused to join them, voicing her distaste for freak stores and anything related to the magical world. While Lily's relationship with her sister had never been perfect, Petunia's hostility had grown worse. The constant name-calling and avoidance had begun to isolate Lily even more. She'd hoped the neighborhood kids might fill the void, but Petunia had warned them all away, leaving Lily feeling even more estranged. Severus Snape, her best friend from the previous year, was nowhere to be found either. He hadn't appeared by their usual meeting spot by the pond in ages, and it left Lily feeling forgotten and alone. However, uh, Diagon Alley lifted her spirits. They enjoyed ice cream from Florian Fortescue's and stopped by the Owl Emporium for treats to send with her owl, Bubo, when delivering letters to Sirius. Lily also restocked her potion supplies and treated herself to some colorful parchment and a quill made from a stunning ostrich feather. Her favorite find was a magical ink that changed colors as one wrote, something she'd never seen before. While browsing through Flourish and Blots, Lily heard her name called out and turned to see James Potter walking toward her, accompanied by a man who looked strikingly similar. His father, she assumed. Out of all the people from school, why did it have to be James? Hey, Evans, he called. Getting your books, too? Lily nodded. Yes, and you. James grinned, holding up Quidditch through the ages. Got all mine, plus this. It's got some amazing plays in here I'm planning to use when I make the Gryffindor team. If you make the team, Lily corrected. Oh, I will, James said confidently. Charlotte James's father placed a hand on his son's shoulder and smiled. Been talking about that Quidditch team since he could talk, he said, turning to Lily's parents. You must be Lily's parents. Charles Potter, he introduced himself, shaking hands with Mr. Evans, who introduced himself and his wife, Rosemary, in return. Charles, clearly a man without much of a filter, quickly remarked, so you're muggles, I take it? Lily blinked at the bluntness, recognizing where James had inherited it from. But her father, unfazed, replied with a good-natured, Yes, we are. Brilliant, Charlotte said with enthusiasm. Always supported muggles myself. James groaned. Dad, stop. He rolled his eyes at Lily as if embarrassed by his father's comment. Anyway, he continued, are you going to try out for the Quidditch team? Lily shrugged. Not really. I'm lending Sirius my broom for tryouts, though. He said the school's brooms are rubbish. James raised an eyebrow. That's nice of you, but you're not using it yourself? I can't exactly fly it at home, Lily pointed out. Too many muggles around, someone would see me. Right, right, James said with a grin that hinted at something judgmental. Just thought it was funny that it's collecting dust while you're not trying out. Lily bristled. I could try out if I wanted. You've never played. James retorted, still grinning. I could learn, she snapped, thinking back to her days on a neighborhood football team before Petunia convinced her to quit. 
Sure, James said, shrugging. But you're a girl. Don't most girls hate sports? You might tear your robes, Evans. Then what? Lily's face heated with annoyance. I'm actually quite good at sports. Thank you very much. James's smile widened, clearly entertained by her reaction. I don't know if I believe you. You should, she said icily. Then try out. He challenged, his eyes gleaming with amusement. Maybe I will, she shot back, her temper flaring. We'll see, James replied with a smug grin. Lily's cheeks burned as she wondered, not for the first time, why of all people it had to be James she bumped into today. She would have much preferred Sirius, Peter, or even her heart skipped a beat. Remus. The thought of Remus made her blush even deeper, and she looked down at her shoes, avoiding James's gaze. Trying to change the subject, she asked, how are the others I've heard from Sirius, but not much from Peter or Remus? James's teasing expression softened. Peter's fine, but Remus, well, he's not doing great. His voice lowered with concern. Lily's heart sank. What do you mean? Is he all right? James shook his head. No, his mom died. Lily's stomach twisted. She was sick, wasn't she? Is that why he was always missing classes? James sighed. She didn't die from illness, Lily. She was killed by you-know-who. Lily gasped, her mind racing. It wasn't because of us, was it? That night in the forest? James shook his head. No, no. His dad works for the ministry on one of the pro-muggle committees. That put a target on their family. Remus's mom was a muggle, and you know who has been targeting families like theirs. Lily glanced at her own parents, her heart racing. Do we need to worry? James seemed to read her fear. The ministry sent out a pamphlet with security advice for muggle families, he said, tugging at his father's sleeve. Dad, do you have that pamphlet about the security measures? Charles, who had been chatting with the Evanses, nodded and began rummaging through his coat pockets. Ah, yes, I think I've got it here somewhere. He pulled out an array of odd items, a fishing rod, several books, but no pamphlet yet. Where did I put that thing? As Charles searched, Lily's mind spun. The dangers lurking in the wizarding world were now reaching beyond just wizards. It was touching the lives of those she loved most. James gestured animatedly, trying to explain the magical properties of the charm. It's bigger on the inside. See? His arms swept outward, mimicking the idea of space expanding in an almost theatrical way. Charles, with a bit more seriousness, pulled a slightly crumpled pamphlet from his robes. Here, he said, handing it over to Mr. Evans. The title read, Keeping Safe During Magical Attacks, with a cartoon family encased in a shimmering shield floating on the cover. Charles's voice dropped slightly as he added, I bet you don't even have any protective charms around your house, do you? No fully qualified wizard here to set one up. I'd be happy to do it for you, if you'd like. Mr. Evans thumbed through the pamphlet, his brow furrowing. Has something happened? Is there danger? Charles began detailing the threats posed by rogue wizards and the growing unrest in the magical world, while Lily turned to James, clearly anxious. What about Remus? Is he all right? James hesitated, guilt evident in his eyes. I don't know. Lily's concern deepened. You don't know? You haven't reached out to him? I tried, James admitted, glancing down. I've had a letter half written on my desk for ages, but what do you even say to someone after their mom's been killed? It feels impossible. You say something, Lily nearly shouted, exasperation edging her voice. You tell him you're there for him, that you care. You don't ignore it. James shook his head, still torn. It's not that simple. I don't want to come across as, you know, pathetic. Lily threw her hands up in disbelief. You're his friend. You'd sound kind, not weak. For Merlin's sake, James, grow up. She sighed, calmer now. I'll write to him myself. Just give me his address. Later, Lily sat by her window, the letter to Remus sealed and ready. It had taken her far longer than she expected to find the right words. As she watched her owl, Bubo, disappear into the distance with the note and the small bracelet she'd made as a token of support, she hoped it would be enough. Her thoughts wandered as she stood up, glancing around her room. Her broomstick stood propped in the corner, its brass plate catching the light. She remembered a time, years ago, when she'd scored an incredible goal in a football game. Her friends had lifted her in celebration, their joy infectious, but Petunia had been different. That was the day she'd quit the team in a fit of jealousy. Petunia hadn't made a goal, and suddenly the sport wasn't fun anymore. It was a familiar pattern, her sister's resentment simmering just beneath the surface. 
Determined not to let old memories drag her down, Lily shook off the thought. Across town, Sirius Black had just arrived at King's Cross, his face set in a rebellious grin. His parents, as cold as ever, had already left, their presence in his life barely more than a formality. He wrestled with his trunk, the weight too much to manage alone. Suddenly, a pair of hands lifted the other side, and Sirius looked up to see James beaming at him. Blimey, mate, what are you wearing? James asked, eyeing the ripped jeans and battered leather jacket Sirius had proudly donned. It's called punk rock, Sirius replied with mock seriousness. Muggle fashion, very rebellious. James snorted, clearly unconvinced. You look like you've been in a scrap. Sirius waved him off, adjusting his jacket. That's the point. It's cool. As they chatted, James' parents, Charles and Dora, approached, guiding James's trolley. Dora smiled warmly at Sirius. So this is your friend? She asked James. Yup. Sirius Black, James introduced with a nod. Dora extended her hand. Nice to meet you, Sirius. We've heard quite a bit about you, Charles chimed in with a grin. All good things, I promise. Sirius shook their hands, a little surprised at how welcoming they were. It was so different from his own family, formal, distant, and disapproving. Charles, after a moment, went into a mini lecture about hair products as they made their way through the station, much to James's exasperation. As they neared the platform, Charles turned to Sirius, his tone suddenly more serious. This sleek, easy potion? It's my latest invention. It's tricky to make, but it works wonders on hair, especially unruly hair like James's. No harm done to dragons in the process, either. Sirius, barely paying attention to the details of the potion, was more focused on the stark contrast between the potter's warmth and his own cold upbringing. Their easygoing nature seemed like a different world from the stiff, hostile environment he'd grown up in. His heart tightened with an odd mix of relief and longing, grateful to have such friends, but painfully aware of what he'd left behind. As they pushed through the barrier to Platform 9 in Quartiqueer, Sirius couldn't help but think that perhaps rebellion was more than just a fashion statement. It was freedom, something he was finally learning to embrace. A new term begins. Sirius ran a hand through his freshly styled hair, its usual wildness now slicked into place thanks to a potion James's father had created. Sleek easy potion, trademarked of course, James quipped with a grin, gesturing toward the barrier ahead. After you. Thanks, Sirius muttered, still thinking about the bizarre description of a molting dragon James had used earlier. What did that even look like? Once their trunks were loaded onto the train, and James had finally pried himself from his parents after an overlong goodbye, they boarded and began making their way down the corridors. Sorry about that, James said, shaking his head. Dad gets obsessed with his work. Once he starts talking about that potion, there's no stopping him. I hate the smell of it, and I look like a right idiot with my hair slicked back like this. Sirius chuckled. I think it's a decent idea. Your hair's never behaved better. James shot him a look. Don't tell him that. He'll never stop bragging. As they reached the compartment where they'd agreed to meet their friends, the carefree banter faded. There, huddled in the corner by the window, was Remus Lupin. He didn't even glance their way when they entered, his eyes fixed on something outside. Sirius and James exchanged a quick, concerned glance before settling into the seats across from him. Outside, uh, Peter Pettigrew was still on the platform, his mother fussing over him, pinching his cheeks and pressing a plate of cookies into his hands. Sirius noticed Remus gnawing anxiously at his lip, looking even paler than usual. His brow furrowed with worry. James, equally unsure of what to say, leaned back in his seat, hoping the mood would shift once Peter joined them. Remus finally turned his gaze to Sirius, his expression weary. What on earth are you wearing? His voice was thick, as though it took effort to speak. It's punk rock, James interjected before Sirius could answer. It's all the rage, and yes, the rip in his jeans is on purpose. He grinned, trying to lighten the mood. No accidents here. Remus raised an eyebrow, clearly baffled, but before he could say anything more, Peter burst into the compartment, his face flushed from both exertion and embarrassment. Hey guys, I brought cookies. Mum made them. He waved the plate enthusiastically, but crumbs were already flying as he stuffed one into his mouth. Want some? He asked, barely coherent through the mouthful of food. James shot Peter a sharp look, subtly nodding toward Remus. 
It wasn't exactly the best time to be gushing about cookies and mothers. Peter, oblivious, held the plate up to Remus's nose. You want one, Ray? Remus shook his head quietly. No, thanks, Peter. More for me, then, Peter said cheerfully, plopping down beside Remus and diving into the cookies again, barely noticing the tension in the air. Sirius, however, couldn't help but stare. Remus looked unwell. His clothes wrinkled, his hair disheveled, and there were fresh pink marks on his forearm, the telltale signs of a recent struggle with himself. You all right, mate? Sirius asked softly, though he already knew the answer. Remus took a deep breath, trying to appear composed. I'm fine, he replied, though the words felt hollow. He could feel the weight of James and Sirius's eyes on him, their concern thinly veiled as pity. He'd seen those looks before, countless times, and he hated them. Peter, too absorbed in his cookies, was thankfully unaware. Not wanting to face their sympathetic stares any longer, Remus turned back to the window. His father was still on the platform, standing alone, watching as the scarlet train prepared to pull away. A lump formed in Remus's throat as he thought of Lyle, left behind yet again, staring after the last part of his family. The loneliness of it all felt unbearable, something Remus knew all too well. He glanced down at his wrist, where the friendship bracelet Lily had sent him lay, its maroon and gold threads woven tightly together. He ran his fingers over the knots, seeking some comfort. Peter let out a loud belch, breaking the silence. The train shuddered to life, slowly pulling out of the station. Goodbye, King's Cross, Sirius said, leaning back with a sigh. James raised two fingers in a mock salute. See you at Christmas, London, he added, sinking further into his seat and pulling his hood up over his head. His feet found their way onto Sirius's lap, and he shut his eyes, though he wasn't truly asleep. As the train picked up speed, the landscape outside blurred into a series of passing houses and fields, but inside the compartment, the awkward silence was thick. Peter had already devoured all the cookies, the now empty plate resting on his knee. James remained still, while Sirius continued to glance at Remus, expecting some kind of outburst or breakdown. Eventually, Remus could no longer stand the weight of their unspoken concern. He stood abruptly. I'll be back in a minute, he muttered, heading toward the door. Where are you going? James asked, sitting up a little. Remus didn't answer by slipping out of the compartment and shutting the door behind him. He wandered down the corridor, glancing into compartments as he passed. It wasn't long before he spotted Lily Evans, her fiery red hair unmistakable, sitting with Alice Bell and Frank Longbottom. He knocked gently and poked his head in. Hey, he greeted, trying to sound casual. Hi, Alice. Frank. Frank smiled, but Remus saw the same apologetic look in his eyes that he'd just escaped from. How are you holding up? Frank asked cautiously. I'm getting by, Remus replied, brushing off the question. He turned to Lily, who thankfully didn't give him that same look. Can I talk to you for a minute? Lily nodded, standing. Be right back, she told the others as she followed Remus out into the hallway. Together, they walked down the corridor, searching for an empty compartment. They finally found one with just a lone Ravenclaw boy inside, his white blonde hair sticking up at odd angles. Hi, Zeno. Lily greeted the boy as they entered. Xenophilius Lovegood glanced up, his large eyes even wider than usual. Careful, he warned in a serious tone. Don't let the rack spurts in. They're everywhere on this train, and I've had to spray for them. The compartment reeked of some pungent air freshener, making Lily's nose wrinkle. We'll be careful, she said, trying not to laugh. Rack spurts? She had no idea what they were, but the heavy scent was far worse. We won't let any... Rust pooties in, Remus added, fumbling the word. Rack spurts? Zeno corrected sternly. Remus, though weighed down by his own troubles, couldn't help but smile slightly at the strange exchange. Maybe, just maybe, this year would get better. Remus shifted awkwardly, glancing at Lily with a soft expression. I just wanted to say thanks, he said, lifting his wrist slightly. For the letter and this. Lily's cheeks flushed pink as she realized what he was referring to. Oh, you're wearing it? Yeah, Remus said, a faint smile crossing his face as he admired how the blush complimented her red hair. I haven't taken it off since you gave it to me. It means a lot. Lily returned his smile warmly. I'm glad you like it. Before their conversation could continue, Xenophilius Lovegood, who had been sitting nearby, suddenly interjected, breaking the quiet atmosphere. You're the one whose mother was killed by the Death Eaters, right? 
he asked bluntly, his gaze unfocused as he stared over the top of a copy of the Daily Prophet, which he held upside down. Remus lowered his eyes to the floor, uncomfortable. Lily immediately bristled, her voice sharp with disapproval. Zeno, that was really insensitive. You need to learn how to be more considerate. Zeno shrugged, seemingly oblivious to the impact of his words, and hid behind his newspaper again. Lily huffed in frustration, but turned her attention back to Remus with an apologetic look. Sorry about that, she said softly. It's all right, Remus replied, managing a small smile. I guess I'll have to get used to it. People won't stop bringing it up. Lily frowned, sympathy written all over her face. I can't even begin to imagine what you're going through. You must have been very close. Remus nodded, his voice quiet and heavy with emotion. She was the best. Beautiful too, like a movie star. She meant everything to me. She sounds amazing, Lily said softly, her heart aching for him. She was. Remus hesitated, then added, Your letter and the bracelet, they helped. I felt less alone, even though everything felt so dark. He almost admitted how it had helped during his transformations, but he stopped short, unable to reveal that secret. Lily smiled, touched by his words. I'm really glad it brought you some comfort. That's what friends are for. As they moved to leave, Remus shot a glance at Zeno before stepping through the compartment door. Later, love good, he said. Cheerio. Zeno called, waving his fingers lazily without looking up from his upside-down paper. Lily and Remus made their way down the corridor, returning to their own compartments. As they reached Lily's, Remus hesitated, then smiled shyly. See you later, Lily. Before he could leave, Lily offered, You're welcome to sit with us if you want. I should probably get back to my own compartment. Merlin knows what James and Sirius have done to Peter by now. Remus replied with a laugh. But thanks, Lily chuckled. If those two get too rowdy, you know where to find me. On impulse, before she could second-guess herself, Lily reached out and gave Remus a quick hug. Her face immediately flushed, and she darted into her compartment without waiting for his reaction. Remus stood there for a moment, his heart racing from the unexpected gesture. With a grin he couldn't suppress, he hurried back to his compartment, feeling lighter than he had in weeks. Meanwhile, Severus Snape hadn't had much of a chance to speak to Lily during the train ride back to Hogwarts. When he'd stopped by her compartment earlier, Alice Bell had informed him that Lily had gone off with Remus Lupin. Frank Longbottom had shot him a suspicious look, which made Severus uncomfortable. He wondered if Lily had told them about how distant he'd been over the summer, or if Frank simply disliked Slytherins. Either way, Severus quickly retreated, frustrated at not being able to talk to her. As he wandered down the train corridor searching for Lily, he accidentally bumped into James Potter, who was waiting in line at the trolley. James turned around with an annoyed expression, which immediately shifted to a smirk when he saw who it was. Oh, it's you, Snivellus, James sneered. Still haven't managed to wash that grease out of your hair, I see. Must be hard to walk straight when you can't see through all that mess. Severus clenched his fists, his anger bubbling up. He had learned some rather dangerous spells over the summer from Malfoy, and was sorely tempted to use them on James right then and there. But with the trolley witch and other students, including Bilius Weasley, nearby, he thought better of it. Suppressing his fury, Severus stormed off. He returned to the Slytherin compartments, giving up on finding Lily. He found a seat with Evan Rosier and a few other second-year Slytherins, but the atmosphere was tense. Many of them knew Severus had spent part of the summer at Malfoy Manor in the presence of the Dark Lord himself, and they seemed wary of associating too closely with him until they were sure of where he stood. Severus leaned back, staring out the window as the train sped through the countryside. Eventually, he drifted off to sleep, dreaming of things far more pleasant than the reality that awaited him at Hogwarts. When he woke, the sky had darkened, and the train was approaching Hogsmeade Station. The familiar silhouette of Hogwarts loomed ahead, casting shadows against the night sky. Severus quickly gathered his belongings and followed the throng of students off the train and onto the platform. First years this way! First years! boomed Hagrid's voice, towering above the sea of students as he herded the nervous newcomers toward the lake. Severus fell in with the crowd, glancing up at the castle with a mixture of dread and longing. Despite everything, 
Despite the Gryffindor bullies, the loneliness, and the whispers behind his back, Hogwarts still felt like the closest thing he had to a home. As they moved toward the carriages, Severus noticed something strange. The carriages were moving by themselves without any visible horses to pull them. He stared, fascinated, as the students clambered in and the carriages rolled forward, seemingly of their own accord. Before he could ponder it any further, he was swept into one of the carriages alongside a third-year Slytherin girl whose dark, intense gaze sent a shiver down his spine. He clutched his book bag tightly as the carriage rumbled up the path toward the glowing entrance of the castle. Despite the challenges ahead, there was a small part of him that felt a flicker of excitement at returning to Hogwarts, a place where magic still held wonder. The carriage came to a halt in front of the grand staircase, where the students hurriedly disembarked, leaving Severus to follow at his own pace. He took his time gathering his belongings, watching the others rush ahead. He climbed the stairs behind a Slytherin girl, drifting along with the tide of students pouring into the Great Hall. The atmosphere was charged with energy. Voices bounced off the high ceilings, filled with laughter, greetings, and stories of summer adventures. But amid the bustle, Severus noticed he was one of the few not joining in the chatter. As he found his seat at the Slytherin table, the noise began to fade. Dumbledore rose at the head of the faculty table, his arms lifting in a gesture that called for silence. Instantly, the hall quieted, every eye turning to him as he smiled warmly at the gathered students. Welcome back to Hogwarts, his voice carried, resonating with a calm authority that commanded attention. A few Slytherins exchanged amused glances, their muffled snickers indicating they found Dumbledore's theatrics unnecessary. Severus, however, paid them little mind, his gaze fixed on the headmaster. Dumbledore signaled to Professor McGonagall, who stepped forward and disappeared through a small door at the side of the hall, emerging shortly after with a line of nervous first years. She led them to the front, where Professor Flitwick magicked a stool into place and set upon it the familiar, weathered sorting hat. The first years fidgeted under the scrutiny of hundreds of eyes, some stealing glances around the vast hall in awe. One or two looked like they might faint. The hat, after a theatrical pause, began its song, a whimsical rhyme that seemed to address the current state of affairs in the wizarding world. Severus listened carefully, his attention caught when the hat veered into what sounded like a cautionary message, hinting at the turmoil brewing beyond the castle walls. Its words were met with varying reactions, applause from most, but the Slytherins seemed largely unimpressed. Yaxley, seated nearby, scowled. Politics from a hat now, is it? He muttered, his voice thick with disdain, as if Dumbledore's speeches weren't enough. Severus, meanwhile, observed the proceedings with detached interest. The hat's cryptic message seemed to ripple through the room, stirring thoughts that went beyond mere house sorting. He watched as the tiny first-year girl named Tabitha Andrews shuffled to the stool, the hat falling over her eyes. She trembled slightly, her small form dwarfed by the grandeur of the hall. As the sorting continued, Severus found his attention drifting toward the Gryffindor table, where Lily sat, her bright smile lighting up the end of the row. She exchanged a few words with Billius Weasley, the new head boy, who was shaking hands with each new Gryffindor. Severus's expression soured. Lucius Malfoy had often ranted over the summer about how unworthy Billius was of such an honor. Dumbledore's favorite, Lucius had sneered, always rewarding those too soft-hearted for their own good. His words echoed in Severus's mind, adding weight to the resentment that lingered beneath the surface. The sorting ceremony seemed to go by in a blur compared to Severus's own first year. Last year, every name had carried tension for him, the anxiety of where he might be placed. But now it felt distant. As Johann Stefan was sorted into Ravenclaw and the ceremony came to a close, Severus's thoughts wandered back to the summer's conversations those subtle, whispered warnings of the growing unrest outside the castle's ancient walls. The tension in the air was undeniable, even in this isolated haven. When Dumbledore finally rose again, his words signaled the beginning of the feast. Golden plates appeared in front of the students, drawing their attention to the lavish meal that suddenly materialized. The hall filled with the sounds of eager chatter once more, but Severus remained quiet, lost in his own thoughts. 
Across from him, Narcissa sat, the glittering engagement ring on her finger catching the light. Without Lucius by her side this year, she seemed out of place, cutting her roast with an air of quiet detachment. Severus glanced around the hall, observing the easy camaraderie between students, the excited faces of the new first years, and the familiar ease with which the school settled into its rituals. But beneath the surface, he could feel the shifting currents, whispers of a world outside that was no longer as safe or predictable as it once had been. As the feast continued, Severus couldn't shake the sense that this year, more than ever, would be different. The Sorting Hat's warning, though veiled in song, had left its mark. An uneasy feast. So when are you and Lucius tying the knot? Alistair Maltzabear asked, his words barely clear around the mouthful of mashed potatoes he was chewing. Narcissa gave him a cool, composed smile, dabbing the corners of her mouth with a napkin. Sometime over the summer, she replied. We'll send you an invitation once everything is finalized. Maltzabear grunted in acknowledgement and promptly turned away, losing interest now that he'd received his answer. His attention shifted back to his brother, Jeffrey, cutting Narcissa out of the conversation without a second thought. Severus watched the exchange in silence, feeling a pang of sympathy for Narcissa. These were Lucius Malfoy's friends, not hers, and it showed. Their respect for her only seemed to exist when Lucius was present, just as Severus had often felt among this crowd. Clearing his throat, he tried to offer something. You must miss him, he said, keeping his voice low. Narcissa gave a small nod, cutting her food into precise pieces. I do. Severus glanced around the Slytherin table, trying to think of something else to say, but coming up empty. He was painfully aware that Lucius's absence left him feeling invisible, too. Without Lucius to act as a bridge, the older Slytherins barely noticed him. The day had been a blur of half-hearted greetings and dismissive nods, and Severus couldn't bear the thought of an entire term spent this way. His mind wandered to Lily, sitting at the Gryffindor table. If he walked over there, she'd notice him immediately, even if James Potter was by her side. But here, in Slytherin, he was just another face, a shadow in the background. He resolved to write to Lucius for advice. He had to find a way to stand out, to show he was worth their time, even without Malfoy around. As his eyes drifted toward the Gryffindor table again, he spotted Lily. She was talking animatedly with her friends, her green eyes glowing with excitement, a rosy flush brightening her cheeks. Severus's stomach clenched when he noticed James Potter nearby, grinning at her. Anger bubbled up inside him, and without even realizing it, he felt the magic surge. Suddenly, the goblet by James's elbow shattered, spilling pumpkin juice all over him. Severus's heart raced. He knew it was him, an unintentional burst of magic, but his doing nonetheless. As James cursed, wiping juice from his face, Sirius Black let out a loud laugh, clearly amused by the mishap. Bloody hell, what happened? Sirius chuckled as he, Peter, and Remus tossed napkins at James to help clean up the mess. I don't know, James groaned. I didn't touch it. It just exploded. Maybe you squeezed it too hard, Remus suggested, ever the logical one. Goblets don't just break on their own. I wasn't even near it, James protested, still wiping his glasses. Sirius smirked. Maybe you did it without thinking, given where your eyes were. He winked mischievously. James shot Sirius a glare. What's that supposed to mean? Sirius nodded toward Lily. Peter grinned. You were staring at Evans again. I wasn't, James snapped, pushing his glasses back onto his nose. I was looking at the new professor. Who do you think she is? Sirius shrugged. Whoever she is, she's definitely pretty. Probably the new Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher. Mama Remus chimed in, tucking his wand away after using it to siphon the juice from James's robes. Moody's gone, remember? Sirius turned sharply. Gone? Where'd he go? He's an auror, Sirius, Remus said with a sigh. He's got cases to work on. Peter nodded, his voice lowering slightly. There have been a lot of murders this summer. Moody's been all over the papers, talking about the... James shot Peter a warning look, cutting him off mid-sentence. Peter blinked in confusion. What? he asked, oblivious to the unspoken message. But before James could redirect the conversation, Remus spoke up, his voice quieter than usual. One of those cases was my mum's. The air in the compartment shifted, heavy with the weight of Remus's words. Peter's eyes widened, his face paling as he mouthed the name... Hope Lupin. 
his cheeks flushed red in embarrassment as he hastily turned back to his plate, suddenly more interested in his food. Sirius cleared his throat, glancing at Remus with sympathy. Look, mate, we're really sorry about that. Remus, however, had lost his appetite, pushing his plate aside. His mind was elsewhere now, far from the great hall and the chatter of his friends. James, always eager to lighten the mood, forced a smile. That new professor is pretty, though, isn't she? Remus barely heard him. His fingers traced the familiar knots of the friendship bracelet Lily had given him, a small token of their bond. The others resumed their conversation, but it felt distant to him, as though he were hearing it through water. His mind wandered back to his mother, to the unbearable void left in her absence. Every mention of her name brought a fresh wave of grief, and even the sight of the new professor's blonde hair reminded him of her. For the first time, Remus found himself wishing for the full moon. At least as a wolf, the pain was simpler, more primal. The crushing grief of being human felt so much worse. Being a boy right now hurt far more than being a creature of instinct and teeth ever had. Finally, the feast came to an end. The food vanished from the plates, and the chatter quieted as Dumbledore stood up at the staff table, his familiar, twinkling gaze sweeping across the hall. Now that we've all had our fill, he began, I would like to extend a warm welcome to Hogwarts. To our returning students, welcome back. And to our new first years, welcome to your new home. I know you're all tired after such a fine meal, so I won't keep you long, but I do have a few announcements. As Dumbledore spoke, Remus barely listened, his mind still miles away. All he could think of was the long term ahead of him, and the even longer nights where the ache of loss would never quite fade. Remus could barely keep his eyes open, longing for the moment he could finally collapse into the comfort of his bed in Gryffindor Tower. The thought of curling up under the familiar duvet was the only thing keeping him going as the evening stretched on. At the head of the hall, Professor Dumbledore's voice echoed across the room. First, allow me to introduce our new Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher, Miss Criselda Blythe. A graceful blonde woman stood up, offering a delicate wave as the hall erupted in applause, especially from the boys, who seemed especially enthusiastic. Bilius even whistled loudly, earning a sharp look from Lily. Honestly, you're head boy now, she muttered, rolling her eyes. Bilius grinned unapologetically. Still got red blood in my veins, Evans. The comment wasn't lost on Derek, who sat nearby, face flushing a deep crimson. He fidgeted awkwardly, trying to hide his embarrassment behind his hands. Sirius noticed and raised an eyebrow. What's up with you? he asked, curious about Derek's odd behavior. Derek shook his head, unwilling to explain. Once the applause died down, Dumbledore continued, his voice firm yet warm. As always, I remind you that the Forbidden Forest is strictly off-limits, he said, casting a pointed glance at the Gryffindor second years, who shifted uncomfortably in their seats under his knowing gaze. Furthermore, Mr. Filch has updated his list of banned items. You'll find it posted outside his office, should you be curious. There was a brief murmur of laughter, but Dumbledore wasn't finished. Lastly, I am pleased to announce that this year, Hogwarts will be hosting a few distinguished students from Ilvermorny, the American School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Sirius leaned toward James, eyes wide with excitement. Americans? Here? That should be interesting. James grinned. Yeah, especially their accents. Should be good for a laugh. Remus raised an eyebrow. What's so funny about their accents? My mum was American, you know. Nothing, mate, James said with a smirk. Just that they sound a bit different, don't they? The room grew louder with excited chatter, and Dumbledore raised his hands for silence. The visiting Ilvermorny students will include members of their Quidditch teams, who will form an all-star squad to compete against a similar team from Hogwarts. We will hold a selection process to determine our best players. James perked up at that, the competitive gleam in his eyes unmistakable. The thought of playing in an international tournament against Ilvermorny's best sent a thrill through him. This is it, he whispered to Sirius. I've got to make that team. Dumbledore ended the announcements with a wave, dismissing the students to their common rooms. Bilius, ever the responsible prefect, leapt into action, directing the younger students toward their dormitories. As they made their way up the spiral staircase, James continued to talk animatedly about Quidditch, but Remus barely listened, 
his thoughts solely focused on sleep. Ever since his mother's death, restful nights had been hard to come by. Back home, the sound of his father's muffled sobs had seeped through the walls every night, a constant reminder of their loss. And when Remus did manage to sleep, the nightmares were relentless. He desperately hoped that returning to Hogwarts would bring some relief, even if just for a night. When they finally reached their dormitory, everything looked the same as when they'd left, only tidier. James flopped onto his bed, sighing contentedly. I miss this pillow, he said, grinning. Me too, Sirius added, stretching out on his own bed. Peter rummaged through his trunk, eventually producing a stash of chocolate frogs which he offered to the group. Anyone want one? Too full, James replied, patting his stomach. Remus shook his head too, already slipping into his pajamas. As he climbed into bed, James, still riding the high of Dumbledore's announcement, asked, What was the deal with Derek? He looked like he'd seen a ghost when Professor Blythe was introduced. Sirius chuckled. I noticed that. Think he knows her or something? Maybe, James mused, but Remus was already fast asleep before they could speculate further. The next morning, they found Derek at breakfast, eating his oatmeal at an alarming pace. He barely looked up as the second-year boys sat around him. What's the rush? Sirius asked, eyeing him curiously. Derek shrugged, still shoveling food into his mouth. Lots to do for Quidditch, he mumbled. I'm the captain for the Ilvermorny tournament. James's eyes lit up at the news. Brilliant. That means we'll be playing together. Derek pushed his empty bowl away, standing up abruptly. Yeah, well, lots of work ahead, he said, his tone distracted. Just as he turned to leave, he bumped straight into Professor Blythe, who was walking toward the staff table. S sorry he stammered, his face turning even redder than before. Without waiting for a response, he hurried off, head down. Professor Blythe watched him for a moment, clearly taken aback by the encounter. Sirius, ever the opportunist, grinned up at her. That was Derek Bell, Professor. He's the Quidditch captain for Gryffindor, and for the Hogwarts team, apparently. He didn't hurt you, did he? She smiled kindly down at Sirius, shaking her head. No harm done. It's wonderful that he's leading the school team. Good for him. Without further comment, she continued on her way, but there was a strange, almost distant look in her eyes. As she walked off, Sirius leaned toward James and whispered, something's definitely up between those two. James nodded thoughtfully. Yeah, there's more to that story. Remus watched Professor Blythe sit at the staff table, her movements sharp with tension. Whatever's going on up there, it's probably best if we stay out of it, he murmured, glancing at his friends. Neither of them looks too pleased. Peter nodded. She's definitely upset about something. Professor Blythe's frustration was evident as she stabbed a strawberry with more force than necessary, her glare fixed ahead. Uh, the boys returned their attention to breakfast, um, staff keen to avoid the mysterious tension lingering at the staff table. As long as this drama doesn't interfere with Quidditch, I couldn't care less, James said, steering the conversation towards something he deemed more important. What do you think about Ilvermorny's team? Sirius smirked. Do the Americans even have a proper Quidditch league? I can't take them seriously if they don't go pro. I'm pretty sure one of the Harpies keepers is American, James mused. Read it in the Daily Prophet once. The conversation quickly turned into a heated debate about Quidditch, which Remus welcomed. He could sit back in silence without feigning interest, and Peter, predictably, focused more on his meal than the talk. Hogwarts buzzed with excitement. With no lessons scheduled for the first few days of the term, students had the rare freedom to relax. After breakfast, the boys made their way to the dormitory to fetch James's broomstick, eager to make the most of the sunny day. Outside, James wasted no time mounting his broom and launching into the air, soaring with a burst of energy. The others chased after him on foot. Their laughter carried on the wind as they sprinted across the grass like children chasing a kite. Impressive flying, Potter, a familiar voice called out. James turned to see Bilius and Derek hovering nearby on their brooms, grinning as he approached. Perfect day for flying, isn't it? James replied with a smug grin. Shame tryouts weren't today. Everyone would be flying like professionals in this weather. Derek chuckled. Tryouts are coming up soon. I still need to book the pitch, but I'm focused on getting the Gryffindor team set first. Good thinking, James said. Just let me know when. I'm in, no question. Derek grinned. 
No surprise there. We all know you're obsessed. James was about to retort when he realized Derek was teasing, and he joined in the laughter. Bilius added, Mate, everyone knows you eat, sleep, and breathe Quidditch. It's hardly a secret. All right, all right, James said, laughing as he parted ways with Derek and Bilius. He touched down gracefully on the grass and handed his broom to Peter, who eagerly reached for it. Take it easy, Peter, James warned, guiding his friend's hands on the broom. Peter wobbled in the air but managed to stay aloft, drawing chuckles from the group. The morning passed in light-hearted turns on James's broom, their laughter ringing out across the grounds. When they finally headed in for lunch, James dominated the conversation with his plans for the upcoming Quidditch tryouts. After finishing his meal, Remus, feeling Quidditch fatigue, excused himself and retreated to the dormitory, leaving the others to return to the pitch. When they arrived, the Quidditch pitch was buzzing with students, all taking advantage of the sunny weather. Among the crowd were Derek, Bilius, and several others, including a few Slytherins. In the stands, Lily Evans sat with her broom propped against her knee, her attention focused on Quidditch through the ages. Oi, Evans, you flying today? Sirius called out, spotting her. Lily looked up, a small smile tugging at her lips, thinking about it. Sirius admired her broom, running his fingers over the polished handle. Nice broom. Have you taken it for a test flight yet? Not yet, she admitted, though her eyes gleamed with anticipation. Before the conversation could go further, Derek called from the field, Potter, fancy joining us for a pickup game? James, already mounting his broom, grinned, absolutely. Derek's gaze shifted. What about you, Evans? Black? Pettigrew? Lily stood, her eagerness clear. Sure. Sirius exchanged a look with Peter before shaking his head. We'll stay here and watch. You two enjoy. James and Lily joined the players on the field while the Slytherins gathered on the opposite side, led by their captain, Alistor Mulciver. Among them was Severus Snape, his expression dark as his gaze locked onto James. We've already won this, James muttered to Lily with a smirk nodding towards Snape. Lily shot him a disapproving look. Don't be a prat, James. Being cocky doesn't make you a better flyer. It's not cockiness, it's confidence, James quipped, flashing a grin. More like overconfidence, Lily retorted, shaking her head as she took her position on the field. Derek, eager to get the game underway, gathered his team. All right, let's win this. I've got a few galleons riding on it, he said with a mischievous grin. The game began, and the exhilaration of competition swept through the players. But underneath the rush of play, tensions between the teams simmered, waiting for the right moment to flare up. I know what a chaser does, Lily said, her eyes bright with excitement, the rush of adrenaline beginning to pulse through her. I've been reading up. James, why don't you take the seeker position? Derek called out, already organizing the rest of the players. James's heart raced at the suggestion, a broad grin spreading across his face. Absolutely, he agreed, his confidence evident. Derek continued assigning positions. Alex, you're a beater. Penny, you'll be the second chaser. Once every player was in place, Derek turned toward the opposing team's captain, Mulciber. They shook hands firmly, and Derek reminded him, We're playing fair, Mulciber. This is for fun, not house points. Mulciber smirked, his expression anything but friendly. Of course, he replied with a tone that suggested the opposite. As the teams took their places, Derek's team members shot off to their positions across the pitch. Up in the stands, Sirius and Peter watched as the players flew into the air. Look who's on the other team, Sirius chuckled, nudging Peter. Snape's playing. This should be entertaining. Peter snickered in response as the game began. Alice Bell tossed the quaffle into the air and the balls were released. The bludgers immediately tearing across the field like unleashed beasts, while the snitch gleamed briefly before vanishing. James hovered high above, gripping his broom, eyes scanning the field. He soon noticed Severus, also a seeker, mirroring his actions. Oi, Snape, are you a seeker too? James called out, his voice taunting. Severus ignored him, jaw clenched in frustration, which only made James smirk more. How are you going to spot the snitch with all that hair in your face? James teased, zipping around Severus and showing off some unnecessary, flashy broom maneuvers. Snape shot back sharply. How will you see it around your oversized ego, Potter? James laughed loudly. At least I've got something worth having an ego about. 
he retorted, pulling into a steep dive that momentarily tricked Severus into thinking he'd spotted the snitch. As James pulled up just before hitting the ground cackling, Severus glared after him. Meanwhile, Lily swooped through the chaos, the quaffle tucked under her arm, and with a swift, effortless motion, scored a goal past the opposing keeper. Cheers erupted from the stands, with Sirius and Peter cheering loudly for her. Breathless but exhilarated, Lily flew past James on her way back down the pitch. I think I might actually like Quidditch, she panted, grinning widely. Great shot, Evans, James shouted, admiration clear in his voice. But before they could exchange more words, a bludger whizzed toward them, sent their way by Evan Rosier. Without thinking, James maneuvered between Lily and the incoming ball, taking the hit directly to his shoulder with a loud thud. He grimaced in pain but quickly masked it. Alex, acting as beater, flew over and deflected the bludger with a solid swing, sending it hurtling back toward Evan. You all right, Potter? Alex called, concern in his voice. I'm fine, James replied, trying to sound casual despite the sharp ache in his shoulder. No way was he going to let Lily see how much it hurt. As the game continued, the opposing team's behavior became increasingly underhanded. Mulciber's team ignored Derek's earlier call for fairness. More than once, they engaged in dirty tactics, with Antonin Dolohov at one point deliberately striking Bilius Weasley with his beater's bat, even when there wasn't a bludger nearby. Still, Derek's team held the lead, thanks largely to Lily, who seemed to have an instinctive knack for the game, scoring several more goals. But James knew the victory wouldn't be secure until the snitch was caught. His shoulder ached more with each passing minute, but he kept his focus, eyes sweeping the sky, knowing Severus was nearby, doing the same. Then, Severus spotted something, a glint of gold near the ground. For a split second, he hesitated, thinking it might have been the sun reflecting off Lily's hair, but then he saw it again, the snitch. Without wasting another moment, he dove, broom angled sharply toward the earth. James, Peter shouted from the stands, pointing frantically at Snape as he plummeted. James reacted instantly, urging his broom into a steep dive, determined to outfly Severus. He felt the air whipping around him as he leaned harder into the broomstick, closing the distance between them. Just before the ground, the two collided, their brooms crashing into one another. Both players tumbled onto the grass, rolling across the pitch. The snitch fluttered just out of reach. James scrambled to his feet first, using Severus for leverage, and lunged for the snitch. His fingers closed around its delicate wings just as it tried to slip away. Got it! He yelled triumphantly, holding the tiny ball aloft. Anger surged through Severus, and before he could stop himself, he muttered, Locomotor Wibbly. Instantly, James's legs wobbled like jelly, and he stumbled forward, crashing to the ground with a painful thud, his shoulder hitting the earth hard. A groan of pain escaped him as he lay clutching the snitch, his arm throbbing in agony. Oh, bloody hell, James gasped, trying not to move his injured shoulder. Derek and several others landed nearby, quickly surrounding the fallen players. Mulciber stormed over, furious. That was an illegal move. The snitch catch doesn't count. Don't be a sore loser, Derek shot back. Your team's been playing dirty the whole match. If we were calling penalties, you'd have been out long ago. Mulciber squared up, fists clenched, but Bilius stepped between them, urging calm. Knock it off, both of you. It's not worth it. This isn't even an official game. With a final glare, Mulciber backed off. I wouldn't want to play with a bunch of mudbloods and muggle lovers anyway, he sneered, his eyes landing on Lily. Tensions rose, but before the argument could escalate, Sirius and Peter hurried over. James needs to get to the hospital wing, Sirius said firmly, motioning to his injured friend. Bilius sighed, pulling Derek away. Let's go. It's not worth it, he said, guiding him off the field. As they walked off, the game dissolved into lingering animosity, leaving James wincing but victorious, the snitch still clutched tightly in his hand. Derek's eyes remained locked on Mulciber, frustration simmering as he and a few other players helped James off the field, his arm limp at his side. The small group trudged across the grounds, the mood somber despite the bright day. As they climbed the stairs toward the hospital wing, Derek couldn't contain his anger any longer. Playing dirty and in a friendly game, no less, Derek muttered under his breath, clenching his fists. They'll regret it, those cowards. Bilius, walking beside him, tried to calm him down. It'll be all right, mate. 
They'll get what's coming to them in time. The bad ones never win in the end. Derek scoffed. The saying's actually, nice guys finish last, but thanks for the optimism. Bilius shrugged, unconcerned. I don't get half of that muggle talk. None of it makes sense to me. Meanwhile, back in Gryffindor Tower, Remus awoke with a start, disoriented. For a moment, he thought he was back at home, back to the haunting days after his mother's funeral. His grandmother's grief-stricken cries had echoed through their small house, shaking him to his core. It took him a second to realize that the sounds now were different. This noise was joyous, not sorrowful. Slowly, the familiar surroundings of his dormitory came into focus just as Peter Pettigrew burst through the door, looking excited. Oh, good, you're awake, Peter grinned, grabbing his empty book bag from the desk. I'm off to nick some butterbeers for the celebration. Remus blinked, still half asleep. What celebration? Peter's grin widened. We won, of course. Come on downstairs, James is retelling the whole match. You'll catch up quick. Without waiting for a response, Peter hurried out, leaving the door ajar behind him. Remus sighed, rubbing his eyes before slowly getting out of bed. He glanced at his reflection in a mirror James had left on his desk, remnants from last term's adventure still visible. He ran his fingers through his hair, attempting to tame it, but gave up after a moment. Not perfect, but it would do. With a deep breath, he made his way down to the common room. The room was packed with Gryffindors from every year, voices overlapping in excitement. Bilius was levitating Gryffindor crests around the room, while a crowd had gathered around James, who stood triumphantly on a coffee table, arm in a sling, narrating the game in dramatic detail. And then I spotted the snitch, James said, mimicking his dive, his knees bent as if he were still on his broom. Snape saw it too, of course. Dive straight after me, just as I'm reaching for it. Bam! He clapped his hands for emphasis, causing a nearby first year to jump. Snape rams into me, no accident, mind you. He didn't even try to slow down, tried to knock the snitch right out of my hand. Hexed me too, knocked me off my broom. Fell twenty feet, easy, and that's how I ended up with this, he said, nodding to his sling. Lily, standing nearby, frowned in confusion. I thought Severus saw the snitch first. James ignored her, continuing his embellished recount of the match. It wasn't even an official game, and they still tried to cheat us out of a win. Derek, still nursing his anger, muttered, Bloody prats! Remus watched from the edge of the room, unconvinced by James's heroic version of events. As the others celebrated, he found himself slipping out unnoticed, seeking solitude in the quiet corridor just outside the common room. He sat down on a flight of stairs, wrapping his arms around his knees, trying to escape the chaos and noise of the festivities. After a few minutes, the quiet was broken by a soft shuffle of footsteps. Remus opened his eyes to find Lily sitting next to him on the stair. Without a word, she handed him a bottle of butterbeer, her own already open. She took a sip, watching him with a thoughtful expression before finally speaking. I know it's not exactly the same, she began, her voice quiet, but sometimes I feel like I've lost my sister too. It's hard, isn't it? When someone you're close to just isn't there anymore. She stared down at her butterbeer, swirling the liquid around inside the bottle. Remus nodded, touched by her honesty. Yeah, it is. Lily sighed, her voice barely above a whisper. Petunia used to be my best friend. I could tell her anything, you know? Now, she won't even talk to me, and when she does, it's just to push me further away. I don't know what to do anymore. Remus didn't know what to say, so he simply listened as she continued. I just wanted to say, I understand a bit of what you're going through, and if you ever need to talk, you can always talk to me. You don't have to go through things alone. Remus glanced down at the friendship bracelet on his wrist, a small comfort he hadn't noticed until now. Thanks, Lily. That means a lot. Lily smiled softly. It's no trouble. I mean it. For a while, they sat in silence, each lost in their own thoughts. Then, after a moment, Lily spoke again, her voice lighter. It's strange, you know. Petunia and I are twins, same genes, same everything. So why did I get magic, and she didn't? Remus shook his head. I don't think magic works like that. It's not like science or something you can predict with genetics. Magic, it's something else. You've got something she doesn't, but it's not just the magic. Lily looked at him curiously. What do you mean? Well, you're still trying, Remus replied, meeting her gaze. You care about her, even though she's pushing you away. 
You haven't given up on her. Lily chuckled, though there was little humor in it. Maybe I should. All it's ever gotten me is a broken heart. Remus shook his head. It's not all bad. You care about people, even when others don't. Like Snape, for instance. You're one of the few people who still stand by him. He was the first person who saw the magic in me, Lily said quietly, her voice tinged with sadness, before anyone else even noticed. Remus smiled faintly. And you're the only one who noticed I'd left the common room. You're always looking out for people, even when no one else does. Lily shrugged, offering him a small smile in return. Well, everyone needs a friend who isn't a prat. Remus smiled softly, catching Lily's gaze. What I'm trying to say is, you've got a gift, Lily. A heart that loves deeply. Maybe that's the real magic in you. The way you care. Lily was taken aback, leaning against the stair in silence. She had never considered her capacity to love as anything special. It wasn't extraordinary. It just felt like doing what anyone would. Severus had been her first friend besides Toonie. He had seemed so lost and lonely. How could anyone not care for someone in pain? And now there was Remus, carrying his own sadness, a mix of grief over his mother and something more, something in his eyes that tugged at her in ways she couldn't quite grasp. Was that love or something else entirely? Her eyes drifted to the back of Remus's head, to the soft hair brushing his neck and the slope of his narrow shoulders. As her gaze traveled down his arms, she noticed something new, faint scars, silvery against his pale skin. Without thinking, she traced a finger along one, making him flinch ever so slightly. Where did you get this? She asked softly. Remus stiffened, then cleared his throat. I don't really remember. You've got a few of them, she noted, her concern growing. He downed the last of his butterbeer, carefully pulling his arm away without offense. We should head back before James starts telling that story again, he suggested, clearly eager to change the subject. Lily nodded, still lost in thought, and followed him back to the common room. She couldn't stop thinking about the scars, though. As they walked in silence, Remus was grappling with something much heavier, the weight of his secret. While Lily was curious, he was terrified. Could she, with her open heart, ever accept what he truly was? He doubted it. The fear of rejection held his tongue. When they returned, the common room was alive with laughter. James, once again, was the center of attention, basking in the glow of his embellished retelling of the day's events. Sirius had joined in, offering his own exaggerated version from the stands. By the time the night was over, no one in Gryffindor would remember the game as it had really happened. That night, as Lily braided her hair and crawled into bed, she reflected on her conversation with Remus. For the first time in a long while, she felt truly understood, as though someone had seen her for who she was. She hugged her pillow, staring out the window at the rising moon, her thoughts drifting back to the sadness in Remus's eyes. Her dreams that night took her to a familiar place, back to the forest from last term. The moonlight filtered through the leaves, and the crunch of twigs underfoot echoed in the quiet. Alone, she wandered, a sense of foreboding clinging to her like mist. Yet this time, the dream was different. Instead of the usual nightmare where Bellatrix's cackling haunted her, there was a strange peace. A figure moved through the shadows, watching her, keeping its distance. Come out, Lily called, her voice calm rather than fearful. Please. The figure hesitated, then stepped closer. Just as it was about to reveal itself, Lily woke to the soft glow of morning sunlight on her face. She pulled the blanket tighter, wondering who or what had stood between her and the usual terrors that plagued her dream. Later, in the common room, Alice Bell was showing some first years how to weave ribbons into their braids, much to their delight. Lily joined in, helping one of the younger girls, her mind still half-occupied by thoughts of her dream and Remus. As they made their way down to breakfast, Alice turned to her with a smile. Thanks for helping out. I, I would have been here forever without you. No problem, Lily replied, smiling back. It was actually kind of fun. Alice's eyes sparkled mischievously. You were just as excited about ribbon braids last year, you know? Lily flushed. Feels like a lifetime ago. As they descended one of the moving staircases, Alice changed the subject. You were brilliant at the game yesterday, by the way. James may have caught the snitch, but you were the real star with all those goals. Lily laughed. James needs the glory more than I do. 
Besides, I'm not sure if I even want to be on the team. Alice's eyes widened. Why not? Lily shrugged, trying to sound casual. Isn't it a bit silly to care so much about Quidditch? We spent all of last year making fun of the boys for being obsessed with it. Alice raised an eyebrow. If you're playing, I might actually become a fan. Lily smiled. You think so? Definitely, Alice replied. If my best friend's the star of the team, how could I not cheer? Lily's smile grew wider, though uncertainty lingered. I don't know about being the star, Alice grinned confidently. I do. Another year, same old classes, James muttered as he glanced at his schedule over breakfast in the Great Hall. Sirius, busy chewing a mouthful of toast, raised his eyebrows. Just wait until next year, then we'll be drowning in even more of them. Enjoy the calm while it lasts. Peter, across from him, looked up in panic, his eyes widening. More classes? I can barely keep up with these. He dropped his schedule onto the table, his spoon clattering into his bowl of sugary cereal. You're joking, right? Sirius grinned mischievously, swallowing his food. Never joke about education, Pete, especially when it's the absolute truth. James smirked at Sirius's playful tone, cramming his timetable into his pocket. You always have something to say, don't you? He rolled his eyes, but his attention was quickly diverted, diverted by a flash of red. He spotted Lily entering the hall, her hair catching the morning light. Blimey, he muttered under his breath, his gaze following her. Sirius, noticing James's distraction, leaned in with a teasing grin. Bet she's been using some of your dad's hair potion. Sleek easy, isn't it? Remus, sitting beside them, looked up in confusion. What's that? James flushed slightly and waved the topic away. Just some rubbish my dad's been tinkering with. It's meant to tame wild hair. Sirius chuckled. Yeah, but only if it doesn't drive the dragons mad first. Remember his plan to shave them all? James groaned, shaking his head. Not all dragons, just the ones in Asia, apparently. Peter squinted, clearly trying to remember something. Sleek easy? I've heard of it somewhere. Not officially out yet, James said, tousling his own hair as if to prove the product's irrelevance to him, but it's popping up in a few shops if you know where to look. Sirius reached over and yanked a strand of James's already messy hair. Clearly, you're not its target audience. James batted Sirius's hand away, laughing. Keep that up! And I'll hex you, Black. Sirius grinned wider. I'd love to see you try, Potter. The two wrestled for a moment, Sirius messing up James's hair even further until James managed to free himself with an exaggerated sigh. As he smoothed out his robes, Lily passed by with a quick glance, clearly unimpressed by their antics, and took a seat down the table with her friends. Sirius finally let go, snickering as James tried to act nonchalant, pretending not to have noticed Lily's fleeting look. Do you reckon classes will be tougher this year? Peter asked, returning to the original conversation. I barely remember last term's charms, and I'm sure Flitwick's going to quiz us first first thing. Sirius shrugged, unconcerned. We'll find out soon enough. Remus, meanwhile, had quietly retreated into his own thoughts, sipping his tea and trying not to glance too often at Lily. He knew James's growing fascination with her, though James had never outright admitted it. Remus found himself silently wrestling with his own feelings for her, wondering what would happen if James realized they both shared the same interest. Suddenly, Lily caught his eye and waved, smiling warmly. Remus's heart skipped a beat. Across the table, James waved back, unsure whether the greeting had been meant for him or Remus. Was that to me or you? He whispered, sounding genuinely perplexed. Remus shrugged, pretending not to know. Who can tell? he said, though inwardly he wondered if Lily had even noticed him at all. Sirius, completely oblivious to the subtle tension, continued talking to Peter about their timetables as the morning carried on. That evening, the four boys found themselves in the Gryffindor common room. Sirius, James, and Peter were locked in a chaotic game of exploding snap, while Remus sat quietly by the fire, Grapak, absorbed in his History of Magic textbook. He found the material far more captivating than Professor Binns ever managed to make it in class. In his mind, the pages came alive with action, though he knew the lessons would never match his imagination. The peaceful atmosphere of the common room was suddenly disrupted as the portrait hole swung open. Professor McGonagall stepped into the room, still dressed in her tartan night robes, her face unusually solemn. The lively chatter fell silent as everyone turned to look at her. 
Good evening, Gryffindors, she began, her voice carrying a heaviness that sent a ripple of unease through the room. It was rare for any professor to visit the common room, and even more unusual for McGonagall to appear after hours. Something was clearly wrong, and the students could feel it. Alice Bell. Derek Rosier, she called out, her voice tight. A cold wave of dread seemed to sweep across the room. Alice, who had been sitting with a group of first years, looked up, her face pale. Derek, on the other side of the room, shared the same uneasy expression as he stood up from the table where he'd been discussing Quidditch with some friends. Alice clutched her robe as she stood, her voice trembling. What's going on? Is something wrong? McGonagall's expression didn't soften, but her voice was as gentle as she could manage. Come with me, dear, she said, not offering any details in front of the wide-eyed students. We'll have some tea and talk. Tears welled up in Alice's eyes, but she held them back, leaning on Derek as they followed the professor out of the common room. As the portrait closed behind them, a tense silence filled the air. The students exchanged uneasy glances, the weight of the unknown settling heavily on their shoulders. What could have happened to warrant such a late visit from McGonagall? It was clear whatever had occurred was serious, and it left a sense of unease hanging in the common room for the rest of the night. James leaned closer to the window, squinting as the faint light from the corridor outside flickered against the thick velvet curtains. The fire crackled in the hearth, casting long shadows across the common room. Most of the students had grown quiet, their playful chatter long forgotten, leaving a tense silence hanging in the air. Billius Weasley looked as if he were about to be sick, his face pale and his eyes wide with worry. Lily sat near the fire, her eyes already brimming with unshed tears. What do you reckon that's about? James whispered, barely audible. Remus, sitting by the fire, didn't turn to look. His gaze was distant, his voice flat. Someone's died. He didn't need to explain further. The way Professor McGonagall had spoken to Alice earlier, offering tea instead of comforting words, was the kind of behavior adults only showed when the news was too devastating to soften the kind of news that couldn't be mitigated by a warm cup of tea. Remus felt the palms of his hands dampen with sweat, his stomach churning at the thought. He fixed his eyes back on the flames, feeling numb. Minutes turned into an hour and then two. The common room remained heavy with suspense. James and Sirius had abandoned their game of exploding snap, while Peter, oblivious or perhaps simply stubborn, made a half-hearted move on the board as if to fill the silence. The first years, who had earlier been fidgeting with nervous energy, now sat perfectly still. Lily, usually so composed, was quietly plaiting a younger student's hair, her hands moving mechanically, more to soothe herself than the child. Bilius, always one for action, couldn't sit still any longer. He paced the room, his frustration growing as the seconds ticked by. After a few more tense moments, he made a sudden decision. That's it. I'm going to find Dumbledore. I'll get some answers. He disappeared through the portrait hole, leaving the rest of the Gryffindors to wait in uneasy silence. When he finally returned, the look on his face was enough to make everyone sit up straighter. His fists were clenched, his expression red with anger and grief. They're gone, Bilius announced, his voice strained. What do you mean, gone? Alex Tineman asked, his voice cracking slightly. Bilius took a deep breath, his eyes scanning the worried faces in the room. Voldemort. He, he killed their parents. A collective gasp rippled through the room. The weight of the news was crushing, and Remus felt a sudden surge of nausea. He bolted from his chair, running to the bathroom before the bile could rise any further. The sound of the door slamming echoed through the common room, but no one spoke. No one moved. The fear in the air was palpable, like a thick fog settling over them all. Why would he do that? A first year whispered, his voice trembling. What did they do? Bilius, his face still taut with frustration, shrugged. Doesn't matter, does it? Voldemort doesn't need a reason. For a moment, the room was silent. Then, inexplicably, James asked, But what about Quidditch tryouts? Lily's reaction was instant. Are you serious? She snapped, her voice cutting through the silence like a knife. People are dead, and all you can think about is Quidditch. Bilius, clearly not in the mood for this, held up a hand. Enough, Lily. <clears throat> Everyone needs to get to bed. It's past midnight and there's nothing we can do for them now. Classes start tomorrow.
The students, still shaken by the news, began reluctantly filing out of the common room. Remus returned, looking pale and weak, and James, Sirius, and Peter hovered nearby, unsure of what to say. As they made their way up to their dormitory, James muttered under his breath, I didn't mean anything by it. I wasn't trying to be rude. Sirius glanced over at him, his voice soft but firm. Maybe next time, just don't say anything, yeah? James nodded silently, the gravity of the situation finally sinking in. Later, in the dim dormitory, the four boys lay in their beds, each lost in their own thoughts. The light from the moon filtered in through the window, casting long, eerie shadows across the room. Remus sniffled quietly, the sound barely audible, but enough to remind the others of the weight he carried. James and Sirius, filled with guilt, lay awake, unsure how to help their friend. Peter, as usual, was the first to fall asleep, oblivious to the tension that filled the room. Down in the seventh-year dormitory, Bilius was still pacing. He hadn't changed out of his robes, too anxious to sleep, too wound up to relax. His best friend was out there, facing unimaginable pain, and there was nothing he could do about it. Uh, Alex Tinneman sighed from his bed, his voice gentle but firm. Mate, you need to get some sleep. There's nothing you can do. Bilius stopped pacing but didn't lie down. This is how it's going to be from now on, isn't it? One by one, we get pulled aside and told our parents are gone, until there's no one left fighting Voldemort. Alex didn't respond, and the silence stretched on for a moment before Bilius continued, his voice thick with emotion. He can kill as many of us as he likes, but there'll always be more of us. I'll fight him until I die if I have to. I don't care. Alex nodded from his bed, his voice steady. And I'll be right there beside you. Derek will too, especially after tonight. Bilius finally sat down on the edge of his bed, his hands running through his messy hair. If Derek even comes back. The weight of the night's events pressed down on them all, and as Bilius stared up at the ceiling, he wondered if he would ever truly feel safe again. Meanwhile, in the girls' dormitory, Lily stirred from a restless sleep. Her dreams had been plagued by unsettling visions. A dark forest, a shadowy creature watching her, protecting her. She was about to drift back into slumber when a small voice broke through the quiet. Lily? Blinking, she reached for her wand. Lumos, she muttered, casting a soft glow around the room. Standing hesitantly in the doorway was Allie Prewitt, a first year, her eyes wide with fear. I'm sorry to wake you, she whispered, her voice trembling. But I can't sleep. I'm scared, and you're the only friend I have here. Lily smiled gently, her heart softening. Come on in, she said, patting the space beside her. Lily scooted over to make room for Allie, who quickly closed the door and jumped onto the bed beside her. What's got you so scared? Lily asked gently, watching as Allie nestled into the blankets. It reminded Lily of the nights she spent with her sister, Toonie, sneaking into each other's beds to share secrets until they fell asleep. This comforted Lily, helping her feel less lonely in the strange world of magic. It's because of what happened to Alice Bell and her brother. Ollie whispered, Their parents? What happened to them was horrible. Lily nodded, her expression serious. I get it. I'm scared too. There are dark wizards out there. The Dark Lord? He's terrifying. I've seen him. But remember, he's still just a wizard like anyone else. One day, someone will stop him. Ollie hesitated before speaking again. It's not just that, she admitted, her voice small. I... I think I might have been sorted into the wrong house. The wrong house? Lily echoed, recalling her own doubts when she first arrived at Hogwarts. She had once believed she belonged in Slytherin, convinced that the sorting hat had made a mistake. The hat rarely makes mistakes, she assured Allie. Gryffindors are supposed to be brave, Allie murmured, but I don't feel brave at all. You are, though, Lily countered, shaking her head. It's okay to be scared. Being brave doesn't mean you're never afraid. Allie's face remained doubtful. I don't know. I'm terrified. Lily leaned in closer. Fear is part of being brave. The real question is what you do with that fear. Do you run from it or do you face it? That's where bravery comes in. You're still here, aren't you? You didn't let fear stop you from coming to me, even when it was scary. That's brave. Allie considered this, nodding slowly. I guess so. And look at everything you're handling, Lily continued. Being away from home, meeting new people, worrying about things happening beyond your control. It's a lot. You haven't given up. That's courage. Allie gave her a small, appreciative smile. Thank you. 
You're welcome, Lily said, returning the smile, and you can come to me whenever you need. They talked quietly for a while longer, but soon exhaustion took over, and both girls drifted off to sleep. For Lily, the familiar dream she had been having since last term didn't return that night. She slept soundly without the eerie forest or the protective presence she usually encountered. The next morning, the castle was bustling with students headed to their classes. Ali and the other first years hurried off to defense against the dark arts, while Lily and her friends headed to transfiguration. As they walked, Sirius grumbled, Strange not having defense today. I was curious about Professor Blythe. Why? Lily asked, intrigued. James jumped in. Derek Bell looked like he was about to dive under the table when she was announced at the feast. Then they had this awkward exchange in the Great Hall. It seemed like they knew each other. Lily raised an eyebrow. Maybe they do. But why are you so interested? Don't you want to know what that was about? James asked, clearly puzzled by her indifference. Lily crossed her arms. Why is it any of your business? James shrugged. I'm just curious. Curiosity can be dangerous, Lily said sharply. If they wanted you to know, they'd tell you. James gave her an exasperated look. You've never been curious before, really? Not about other people's private lives, Lily shot back. Maybe you should worry about your own problems instead of sticking your nose in theirs. Sirius chuckled, trying to diffuse the tension. Easy now. Let's not start hexing each other before class. Lily glared at James, but she let the argument drop. Inside, though, she couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to the story. As much as she hated to admit it, maybe James was onto something. Something that could unravel a deeper mystery within the castle. As they approached the Transfiguration classroom, Remus pointed out they had arrived. You really don't want to jinx him in front of McGonagall, he cautioned Lily. That's a sure way to earn yourself a detention, and on the very first day of classes, there'll be plenty of time for the two of you to hex each other later on. Lily frowned, but knew he had a point, as did James, and they both quieted down, following Remus, Peter, and Sirius into the room. Upon entering, they noticed something odd. The classroom was empty, with no sign of Professor McGonagall. Confused, they took their seats, each exchanging puzzled looks. Remus flushed when Lily sat beside him, her arm brushing against his occasionally. His pulse quickened, and the scent of her hair distracted him more than he'd care to admit. Peter, meanwhile, took a seat on his own, looking as nervous as ever. Transfiguration wasn't exactly his strongest subject, and his discomfort showed. James, checking his surroundings, asked, This is the right class, isn't it? Peter, eyes glued to his timetable, nodded. Yeah, transfiguration right after breakfast, then charms before lunch. James smirked and nudged Sirius. Look, Filch has a new cat. Guess old Mrs. Norris finally kicked the bucket. About time. That cat was half dead anyway. Sirius glanced over and saw a sleek gray tabby watching them from the teacher's desk. You don't think Filch is teaching, do you? He asked, back half-joking, but the idea seemed unsettling enough. What if McGonagall got held up and they called him in to fill her spot? That'd be a nightmare. I heard Filch is a squib, James whispered conspiratorially, always prying into other people's business, aren't you? Lily shot back without turning around. James glared at her, his tone dripping with irritation. Maybe if you didn't have ears like a bat, you wouldn't hear things you're not supposed to. Lily whipped around. Maybe if you didn't have a mouth the size of the Great Lake, I wouldn't have to. With a smirk, James retorted, I thought you liked people with big noses. Isn't Snape your favorite after all? Lily's face reddened. I've never snogged Severus, and for Merlin's sake, stop calling him that ridiculous name. Snivellus, Snivellus, James muttered under his breath in a mocking tone. Greasy-haired Snivellus. Before Lily could respond, Sirius gave James a sharp elbow to the ribs. Hissing, shut up! James blinked in confusion until he noticed Sirius wasn't staring at him but at the front of the room. Where the gray tabby had been moments earlier, now stood Professor McGonagall. Bloody hell, James whispered. The students sat frozen, staring at their professor in amazement. Remus felt a flicker of hope deep inside. If McGonagall could transform so easily between human and animal, could she teach him something about controlling his own transformations? His quill hovered eagerly over his parchment as he prepared to jot down every word of her lesson. Peter, still stunned, squeaked out, 
How did you do that? Professor McGonagall, casting a stern glance at James and Lily, who both looked guilty, finally turned her attention to Peter. I am an animagus, she said. It's a highly advanced form of transfiguration, one that takes years of dedicated practice. Only the most skilled witches and wizards ever learn it. Lily raised her hand. Does it hurt when you change? McGonagall shook her head. No, Miss Evans, it's a bit uncomfortable, but certainly not painful. Remus couldn't help but think how different his own transformations were. Far from mildly uncomfortable, they were excruciating. Can you change any time you want? Sirius asked, clearly fascinated. Yes, McGonagall replied, her tone brisk. To prove her point, she quickly transformed into the gray tabby once again before shifting back into her human form. The students noticed the tabby's markings around her eyes mirrored her glasses. Peter leaned forward, eyes wide. Can you understand us when you're a cat? McGonagall morphed back into her human form, rubbing her ear, slightly exasperated. Yes, Mr. Pettigrew, I can understand perfectly well as a cat. In fact, she added, casting a sharp glance at James, my hearing is much sharper in that form. James slid lower into his chair, knowing exactly what she was implying. Lily raised her hand again. Do you choose what animal you turn into? McGonagall shook her head. No, Miss Evans. The form you take as an animagus is determined by your inner nature, much like a Patronus. Some magical cultures believe this form is linked to one spirit animal, a creature that reflects your character and life lessons. You don't get to choose, and sometimes the form may even change after a significant life event. Do you like being a cat? Lily pressed. McGonagall gave a rare smile. It can be quite peaceful, although I could do without the hairballs. She cleared her throat and conjured herself a cup of tea before continuing. Sirius, unable to resist, asked, How do they know Voldemort isn't disguising himself as some random rat or bird to sneak in and out of places? What's stopping any dark wizard from doing that? McGonagall sipped her tea calmly. There is a registry, she explained. Any witch or wizard who becomes an animagus must register with the ministry. Their specific animal form and unique markings are recorded. What if you don't register? James asked, a mischievous grin spreading across his face. Do you get sent to the pound? McGonagall's eyes flashed. No, Mr. Potter. You are sent to Azkaban. Failing to register is a serious crime, precisely because of the potential for misuse. The room fell silent. James's grin disappeared. Peter, still looking nervous, asked, Are you going to teach us how to become animagses? McGonagall shook her head firmly. No, Mr. Pettigrew. As I said, it's advanced magic, far beyond your current level. It takes years of study and practice. None of you are ready for it yet. Peter blushed, clearly embarrassed, but McGonagall pressed on. Today, however, we'll start with something more appropriate for your skill level. She waved her wand, and a box of small white mice appeared on her desk. Sirius leaned over to James, whispering, Her snacks for later? James covered his mouth to stifle his laughter.